Hello everybody and a very warm welcome to uh, our workshop today on the French elections and um, thank you so much to those who have joined us. Um, we have a very exciting program today looking back on the presidential elections trying to understand the outcome and also looking forward to the legislative elections coming up um, next month and anticipating the results of them and also thinking about the longer term issues and challenges that uh, Macron will face as president over the coming five years. Um, to kick us off, we have a fabulous roundtable right now. Um, I, ah, I have been assured by one of our participants who's currently missing that he's on his way. Um, and I've just received an email from Helen Drake um, to me to, uh, saying that she's, oh, she's joined us. Yes. She's in, yes. sorted. Yeah. Okay, so we, we have our panelists. Um, uh, one of them, Andrew Knapp, is just about to join us, I believe. So hopefully he'll be with us in a moment. Sorry? Yes. Um, allow me to introduce a couple of the other participants on this round table. Um, my highly esteemed uh, Queen Mary colleague, uh, Françoise Bucek, um, who is an expert amongst other things on um, political parties and the party system in France, which is a theme that will be coming up um, in more detail later in today's workshop when people look at individual parties. But Françoise is able to give us some insight into the um, party system as a whole and the impact of these elections upon it. Um, hooray, Andrew has joined us. Um, we are also joined by um, Susan Collard um, from the University of Sussex, who um, is an expert on a variety of things pertaining to French politics, but one area of particular interest to her is how the vote of French citizens living overseas uh, has shaped the elections. Um, so expats um, from France are allowed to vote in different parts of the world where they now reside. Um, in fact, they even have their own representatives um, for the last um, decade or so in the National Assembly. Um, and so she's going to be speaking to that theme. And uh, we've just been joined by Andrew Knapp, um, who, yeah, thank you, hi Andy, um, who is um, a long-standing expert on um, French politics um, and emeritus professor at the University of Reading, um, author of many an interesting book about the French political system, um, who's also going to be giving us insights into the impacts of these elections on um, the organization of um, French political parties, um, but from a slightly different angle to Francoise Bouchek. And um, because I've been unfortunately quite unwell, um, I'm going to curtail my own contribution and therefore temporarily taking the chair, but um, I might say a few words after my fellow, fellow panelists, if that's okay. Um, if it's all right with everybody, I might ask uh, Francoise to kick us off. So what we're going to have is we're going to have each of our panelists talking for about seven minutes. Um, then they can have a quick response to each other's presentations, after which we will invite questions from the audience. So please do think about some questions that you would like to share with the panel, and we look forward to hearing from the audience as well. Um, but for now, I will pass over to you, Francoise. Thank you, Rainbow. Thank you very much. So as an expert on the study of political factionalism and dominant political parties, I thought I would spend my seven minutes this morning to talk about the pressures on unity inside the three main political groups and coalitions in the center, on the left, and on the extreme right for the legislative elections and beyond. So the 2022 French presidential election reinforced the party de-alignment that was triggered by Macron in 2017 and produced a very fragmented and fluid party system which feels unstable. And this instability results from the collapse of the two former mainstream parties, the Republicans and the Socialists, and the fragility of the strategic uh, political coalitions that have been set up to fight next month's elections. 
And these coalitions of political movements, factions, and parties must coordinate their election strategies at constituency levels for candidate selection, but also for withdrawals and after the, for the second round. But they also need to show a united front to the public during the campaign. Uh, internal pressures are bound to intensify inside Macron's central right coalition, now labeled Ensemble, which is predicted at least a few days ago to retain a parliamentary majority of between 210, 310 and 350 seats. Uh, but factional pressures uh, will be equally, if not more, challenging for Jean-Luc Mélenchon, whose left coalition is predicted to become the official opposition, at least according to Opinion Way uh, poll a few, a few days ago. So let me start with Macron centrist coalition. For the presidential race, then the most pressing concern for Macron was to hold the political center against populist forces on the left and right. And he owes his victory to A, voters uh, keen to keep out Le Pen rather than who supported him outright uh, in the second round. And B, like in 2017, to moderate conservative center-right voters who natural party, the Republicans, was decimated after five years of co-optation into the neoliberal presidential majority and the executive. And of course, a lackluster campaign by Valérie Pécresse. So Macron's uh, centrist coalition contains three blocs, La République en Marche, uh, his party now renamed Renaissance, Modem, the democratic movement of veteran centrist leader François Bayrou, and Horizons, a center-right party formed last October by Édouard Philippe, Macron's first prime minister and mayor of Le Havre. And this is an interesting uh, aspect. Philippe is a politician from the Republican Party who never joined La France Insoumise. He claims to have set up this faction called Horizons to mobilize center-right support for Macron for the presidential race and to maintain the presidential majority in the forthcoming legislative elections. However, many suspect his motivations are more personal and that Horizon is a vehicle to promote his own presidential ambitions for 2027. And he has actually set up some 250 local committees already. So if the presidential coalition retains its majority next month in the National Assembly, Horizons could become a pivotal player in the National Assembly. So this would put the government in an uncomfortable position. And whatever happens, internal tensions and factional competition are likely to increase in the presidential majority as different groups of MPs begin to disagree over the details of government policies and reforms. I would argue, according to my own model of factionalism, that cooperative factionalism, this face of factionalism that is now in existence, in effect, uh, in the presidential majority, might give way to a competitive form of factionalism. For instance, as I thought, I just mentioned if Horizons becomes a cohesive parliamentary group with veto power over government legislation. However, to carry out his pension reforms and his social and green policies, Macron will need parliamentary support from the center left. And so now it's the center left that Macron hopes to co-opt. And that's why he appointed last week a social liberal as prime minister and several left politicians in the new government. So Elizabeth Le Bourne, Elizabeth Bourne rather, uh, her immediate task is new, new prime minister's immediate task is to manage those different political factions in the presidential coalition so they can win a majority and implement their agenda. But of course, she's herself also campaigning to win a seat in the National Assembly as uh, in the Calvados Department since she's never held uh, elected office before. Okay, now I'll say a few words about the Mélenchon's left coalition and very briefly Le Pen's coalition. So Mélenchon's left coalition 
Uh, well, after coming a very close second behind Le Pen, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, the leader of La France Insoumise, a radical left party, faces a similar challenge in holding together his popular union, now called Nouvelle Union Populaire, Ecologique and Social, New Pens. A uh, very cumbersome name, as he uh, admitted himself. So NUPES or NUPES is an even more heterogeneous group of parties with divergent preferences than Macron's presidential bloc. It brings together Mélenchon's radical left party, La France Insoumise, the Communist Party, the Green Party, ELV, Europe Ecology Les Verts, and some socialists. However, there is opposition within the socialist ranks about joining this alliance. The socialists paid, of course, an even heavier electoral cost than the Republicans for joining the presidential majority in the last parliament. Their presidential candidate, Mayor of Paris, Annie Hidalgo, got less than 2% of the popular vote. So like the Republican, the PSF, the uh, Socialist Party, is now facing an existential crisis, hence why some dissidents are refusing to join Mélenchon's popular union. So if Mélenchon's bloc becomes the official opposition, which is predicted to be the case, and they, it looks like they might win about 150 seats, then we can expect legislative instability, if not a return to street protests. So NUPS uh, will qualify to form a party group in the National Assembly, since it requires only a minimum of 50 seats to do so. But they will need uh, at least 58 seats to table a motion of censure against the government. So they will have to be a cohesive group to be an effective opposition. Hence why Jean-Luc Mélenchon, when they formed this union a few days ago, said the idea was not to form a fusion ideologique. So finally, a few words about Le Pen's extreme right. So Marine Le Pen also needs to unify forces on the extreme right if she wants to increase her party's representation in the National Assembly. This is a tough call for her, as she blames uh, Eric Zemmour, the leader of ultra-nationalist faction Reconquête. She blames him for splitting the traditional extreme right vote and depriving her, as she sees it, of a victory in the second round of the presidential election. So mathematically, the extreme right's share of the vote for the first round of the presidential race was just over 32% if you add the support of Le Pen, Zemmour, and uh, uh, Nicolas Dupont-Aignan, uh, leader of uh, Debout la France, another uh, right party. However, as we all know, dynamics are very different for legislative elections we are looking at, in fact, are 577 different races. And Le Pen hasn't so far shown much enthusiasm during this campaign so far. But as Rainbow said earlier, we'll hear a lot more about the individual parties uh, this afternoon and, uh, and probably by my, uh, my other panelists right now. So thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you so much, Francoise. Um, I'm delighted that we've now been joined by uh, Emily St. Denis, who, uh, along with myself and Francoise, is one of the conveners of the Political Studies Association's um, French Politics and Policy Specialist Group, who are one of the organisers of today's event. And um, I'm now going to pass the baton to Emily to chair the remainder of the roundtable. Thanks very much. Uh, lovely to be with you. Sorry that I was late. Uh, it's an hour later for me here as well, so I need to remember that it's an hour earlier for the timing. Um, and so I've understood that the next person up we've got is, is Sue, Sue Collin. Um, and after that, uh, Andy, and then closing with Rainbow, if possible. Um, and I'll, I think what I'll do is I'll send, um, I'll send the speakers a direct message, a little private message when they've got about a minute left of their seven-ish minutes speaking. Sue? Off to you. Okay. Hi. Um, so, um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about the vote of the French abroad, um, which I got interested in sort of 10 years or so ago. Um, so the French electorate abroad um, really has been, um, was of little political interest before the 2007 uh, presidential election. 
um, French citizens living abroad had acquired the right to vote from abroad as opposed to having to go back to France to vote um, in the wake of the introduction of the European elections in 1979. And the first time they voted from abroad in the presidential election was 1981. And the result was massive support, 70-30 for Giscard, when Mitterrand won in France. Uh, and this established the idea that the vote abroad uh, was massively um, in favour of the right. Um, but the numbers of people actually registered to vote uh, were quite low. Um, and um, it wasn't till really the early 21st century uh, that figures started to show a marked increase in the number of expatriés, uh, which apparently technically is people who are posted abroad, but the word expatriates is kind of used. I won't go into that discussion, but I might call them expatriates at some point. Um, so it was the candidate Sarkozy in 2007 who kind of really twigged that actually lots of young people were coming to London and the French abroad was a bit of a thing. And this was partly because um, the, one of the daughters of Cecilia was living in London and came to visit and he actually uh, came to London and made a campaign speech to the, um, to the French in London, as did then Ségolène Royal. So this kind of, you know, this for the first time put the French abroad on the political map really as kind of being, um, making a difference. Um, and once uh, Sarkozy well, was elected president in 2007, uh, as part of his constitutional reform, he created the 11 um, constituencies abroad that you can see in the map on the right there. Um, giving representation in the National Assembly for the first time, um, the French abroad already had indirect representation in the Senate through the consular elections, but this gave them uh, seats in the National Assembly. And of course, Sarkozy was assuming given the, the uh, history of voting abroad, that these would be a clutch of seats for the right. Um, but although they did support him in the 2000, 2007 and again in 2012 in the um, presidential elections, the, the first um, uh, legislative elections for uh, in 2012 for the uh, overseas seats, actually um, uh, eight of them went to the left. So it didn't quite turn out as he'd expected. Um, so um, this made actually quite a difference to the size of Hollande's majority. So if you remember, the Socialist Party only got 258 seats on their own. You need 289 for a majority. So his, his government was, a, his majority was a sort of coalition. So actually having eight extra seats did make a difference. Um, so um, with regard to um, uh, the French abroad, the impact of that vote, regardless of how many people actually vote, uh, so on the one hand there's how many are registered to vote and then how many actually turn out to vote, they still have, they still have an impact um, through the 11 seats in the National Assembly. And often those deputies are elected with very small numbers um, of seats, which has kind of raised questions about their legitimacy and things. Um, so um, these just, Two maps here just show you so where the French abroad are. So half of them in Europe and then half of them spread in different continents um, across the world. Um, so if we go on to the next slide and look at the results for the first round, um, I've added on there onto the French slide, um, just under 1.5 million registered voters this time, which is about 200,000 up on the last election. Um, Pretty significant abstention, 65%, very few blanc and nul, uh, but Macron um, does well, um, 45%. Um, Mélenchon, roughly the same as in France. Zemmour does better than in France. So does Jadot, um, and Le Pen does um, significantly worse, Pégresse uh, about the same. Um, so if we go on to the next slide, um, yeah, in the second round, um, the French abroad give Macron 86% uh, as opposed to um, just under 14 for Le Pen. Abstention went down a little bit, 61.38. People got out in the second round, but again, Blanc and Nul, um, not particularly um, significant. 
Um, so, um, if we compare that, if we go on to the next slide, just quickly compare it to 2017 when Macron won a kind of landslide uh, victory, almost 90% in the second round. Um, he improved on his score 45 as opposed to, to um, 40 in the first round um, in 2017. Uh, but what we can see this time compared to 2017 is that whereas Fillon uh, was in second place, we've now got Mélenchon in second place um, after Macron in the first round. Um, we can see also that abstention has gone up, 55% in both rounds, roughly in 2017, that's gone up 10% to you know, 65 in the first round, a bit lower in the second round. So there's a, an awful lot of abstention um, going on, and this is partly for practical reasons, various other things which we can talk about if anyone's interested. So my final slide is just to um, talk a little bit about, there's a lot of diversity within this electorate. Um, and uh, I don't know where, oh, can you, uh, I was gonna show you that link, but anyway, if anyone's interested in looking, Le Petit Journal, which is sort of dedicated to the French abroad has done a, a sort of bar chart where it shows for every single um, consular constituency um, the, the effect of the candidates. So I've just picked out a few highlights here that Macron does particularly well around 90% in Germany, the UK and the USA, no surprises there. Uh, also, no surprise, very low support in Russia, 23%. Uh, Mélenchon scored very well in North Africa, around 40%, especially in his native Tangiers, 54%, and 32% in Berlin. I guess that's all those young hipsters. Um, Le Pen generally scored pretty poorly, as last time in 2017, doing best in the Balkans and Russia. And if I have time to talk about it, there's a few uh, retiree, don't think I will, uh, we can come back to it in the Q&A, retiree pockets in Africa, which one French researcher has um, defined as heliotropism. I'll come back to that if you're interested. Um, finally, Zemmour, um, significantly higher than Le Pen. If you, I've picked out a few places where he did particularly well here. El Mati, by the way, if you're wondering where it is, it's Kazakhstan. <laughs> 45%, not many voters there, but they obviously like Zamor. Um, Israel is the kind of thing that I thought was interesting. 53.59%. Um, now, this is with a very low turnout of 10%. Um, um, but why did, um, why did so many people vote for Zamor in Israel? Uh, well, obviously, Zamor is Jewish. Um, a lot of people who've moved to Israel have done so because of feelings of security, uh, insecurity in France, feelings that there's a sort of laxist attitude by the state to acts as anti-Semitism. They agree with Zemmour's idea of the grand remplacement. They're pretty Islamophobic. And of course, we know that the uh, Zemmour appeals to wealthier voters, um, unlike Le Pen. So finally, for the legislative elections, what's going to happen? Well, this is very much an open, um, an open game, really. One interesting story will be to watch Manuel Valls, who's standing in the fifth constituency in Barcelona, the Iberian Peninsula, uh, which has put the nose out of the incumbent, and who I think is going to stand as a dissident against him. Um, turnout is likely to be low. The last two times it was under 20%. Um, but Mélenchon has everything to play for here. So unlike in the presidential elections where parties don't seem to have been, done much electronic campaigning, uh, Mélenchon needs to get that out, out there this time and see if he can sort of um, make the best of that high vote he got in the presidential um, round, in the first round. Okay, so I think my time's up. Thank you so much. That was really interesting. Um, and thanks so much, both of you, for you know, sticking to time beautifully as well. Uh, we've got Andrew Knapp next, I believe. Good morning. Um, right, I'm trying to make sense of the party system, not finding it very easy. Um, the, best, the best I can do, I think, is to think of it in terms of levels. Um, depending on what really on, on which lens you want to put on to look at it. Um, so it's sort of two Frances, three blocks and an archipelago. Um, 
Two Frances, if you look at the second ballot, um, three blocks, if you look at the first ballot and at um, the current set, set up for the uh, legislative, um, and an archipelago, if you look at almost anything else. Second ballots first. Um, worth remembering, there were six presidential elections in the 20th century. Five second ballots were straight left-right runoffs. There have been five presidential elections in the 21st century, of which three were right versus, or center-right versus far-right runoffs, 20, 2002, 2017, 2022. If you look at the second ballot breakdowns for um, 2022, if you just sort of take the date out and take the candidates' names out, you could almost, almost be looking at, for example, uh, Giscard Mitterrand in 1974. That is the class difference um, is very, very marked. You have Le Pen doing extremely well among blue collar workers, among white collar workers, to a degree among uh, professions intermédiaires, um, and much less well among wealthier categories. You have Macron looking like, in many ways, a very conservative electorate. People who are well off vote Macron, older people vote Macron, retired people vote Macron, people who are happy with their lives and so on vote Macron. Um, this almost, Macron almost looks like Giscard and Le Pen almost looks like Mitterrand. There are differences. Um, religion, or the Catholic religion anyway, is clearly a much less structuring factor. Um, and of course, uh, Giscard's victory against Mitterrand in 1974 was very uh, narrow, whereas Macron's is much more comfortable. This pattern um, is, of course, not altogether new. That is, uh, working class and vote and taken in the largest sense um, going for the far right. Um, it's not altogether new and it's not altogether French. If you think of the Brexit vote in the UK in 2016, if you think of the European referendums in 1992 and 2005, um, they all prefigure this new-ish configuration, which has been analyzed in quite a lot of detail by Lots of people, for example, Pierre Martin's excellent book published in 2018. Um, more recently, also Thomas Piketty had had a go at it. That might suggest that Macron has simply sort of managed to shift the party system one space to the right, as it were, that instead of having left right, you now have um, center right and far right. It's actually, of course, rather more complicated than that. And the French institutional setup um, sort of constrains the party system into this second ballot without it necessarily falling naturally into place. Um, for most of the 20th century, the left-right configuration of the second ballot reflected, roughly speaking, a group of block of parties on the left and a block of parties on the right. But if you look now at first ballots as at the configuration for the legislative, you're looking, of course, at three blocks, of which perhaps the most interesting is Mélenchon's, because it is rather more cross-class than either of the other two. It's above average among blue-collar workers, um, unlike Macron's. Um, but it also has a significantly higher proportion of educated people than Le Pen's. People who are unemployed, people who are dissatisfied with their lot in life, people who are on low incomes um, do rather well for Mélenchon. People who consider themselves as populaire and défavorisé, also under 35s, 
also Muslims do well under Mélenchon. So it's a rather unusual original sort of configuration, which geographically also is a bit of a hodgepodge. In some ways, it looks like the classic left-wing electorate to which is added um, various alternative rural areas like the Larzac and also Brittany, of course, traditionally right-wing, but has shifted towards the left in recent decades. Sociologically, it's a much less type vote than Le Pen's. So anyway, we've got three blocks, apparently. We've got a more sort of bourgeois block in um, Macron. You've got a um, more working class block in Le Pen's electorate. And then you've got this hodgepodge, um, rather cross-class for Mélenchon. Um, if we turn now briefly to the um, system sort of below the national level, I think it turns out that, first of all, a block, it sounds like something terribly solid. In fact, I think in the present context, we're talking about something that could readily fall to pieces, given a good push. And Francoise has already highlighted some of the um, fragilities in the various blocks. I'd also, though, like to suggest that the um, realignment is not as complete as one might imagine. I, I'm afraid I haven't got slides to share, but I have got this. I don't know if you can see it. This is Le Monde from less than a year ago after the regional elections. Défaite sévère pour le RN et LRM sur fond d'abstention massive. Um, less than a year ago, in other words, the big parties were definitely not the the Rassemblement National and the LRM who got to the second ballot of the elections, they were still the Socialists and the uh, Les Républicains. And they remain strong at local and regional level. So the question is, and there is to a degree of precedent for that in the de Gaulle party system of the 1960s, the question is how much these better local routes of the old parties are going to survive faced with three organizations, um, NUPS and the Rassemblement National and Ensemble, all of which are really vehicles for presidential candidates and tend to lack local roots. Final point. Um, this is going to be an extraordinarily stressful cancana for Macron. I, whether you want to talk about a perfect storm or about horsemen of the apocalypse, um, he's going to face the fallout of the Ukraine war, which is only just beginning, um, climate change, stagflation, energy insecurity, um, a, a ballooning deficit with rising interest rates, and probably difficulties with Europe as well. It's going to be a, a set of very fragmenting forces. Thank you very much. Sorry if I've overstayed my welcome. Not at all. That was beautiful timing. Um, thanks very much for that. On that extremely cheerful note. Um, <laughs> also, if you've not noticed, uh, Tamara has very kindly put the URL link to the Petit Journal article that was in Sue's PowerPoint, if you're interested in having a look at that. Um, but first, last but not least, in any way, Rainbow's up next. Um, thank you. Last and definitely least, unfortunately. Um, so please bear with me. I've been um, very unwell for the last few weeks. So my uh, contribution is not as well prepared as I would have wished, but I will do my best. Um, so I wanted to talk about um, a topic that's quite close to my heart in this election. I've spent the last few months talking about every other dimension. And today I'm gonna to indulge myself and talk about gender in this election, um, because I do think it was a, an interesting facet of the election and one that perhaps hasn't received as much commentary as it deserved. Um, as a starting point, something that would have seemed extraordinary only a few elections ago, the two mainstream parties, as used to be anyway, the, the Socialist Party and the Republican Party, both had a female candidate, um, which 
previously would have been a big deal, but this election, it wasn't really a big deal because neither candidate went anywhere in this election. In fact, they, they both came under the 5% margin where they would get their election expenses reimbursed. So um, we could perhaps uh, line up the willingness to feminize with the collapse of the parties, uh, sort of classic glass cliff scenario where women are only allowed in once the party is already on such a downward spiral that they're, they're pretty much um, being thrown off the cliff with their party. Um, so moving on to the two main candidates um, for the second election in a row, we had um, a, a woman in the second round, Marine Le Pen, and um, she's an interesting candidate being a woman from a far right party that is traditionally considered um, very anti-feminist and has traditionally had a very masculine electorate. But she has used her status as a woman as part of her detoxification or the deionization strategy. Um, she's uh, sort of played up um, her status as a, as a single mother. Um, you know, uh, she posts lots of pictures of herself playing with her cats on Instagram, um, trying to create this softer image and using her gender strategically to soften the traditional hardline dimensions of um, the far right. And she's also, to some extent, uh, tried to portray herself as a feminist, which is an unusual position for a far right candidate to be in. And, um, you know, her, her feminist credentials are, are definitely questionable. Um, I think uh, many would still see her and her party as very much anti-feminist. And some of the things that she has put forward as feminist are in fact pretty nakedly racist. So for example, um, her attacks on um, Muslim headscarves and in fact, most elements relating to Muslim women have been framed as a sort of feminist emancipation of women um, and a protection of them from the sort of the barbarism of Islamism, when in fact, it's, it's just racist attacks on the Muslim community, um, using stereotypical assumptions that um, Muslim women are sort of helpless and lacking in agency and that Muslim men are sort of uh, controlling and domineering, uh, both of which are, are just stereotypes and not helpful and are rejected by many feminists as a usurpation of their cause to try and legitimize a racist discourse. Um, so some of what she's doing isn't really feminist at all, um, but, being a woman, she does have a certain degree of um, authenticity, I think, when she sort of claims to understand women's needs and what it feels like to be a, a you know, woman in public life and dealing with some of the challenges that women face. And this might help to explain how she has managed to turn around the gender gap, um, at least within her political party. Now, I'm going on data from before the elections. I haven't yet been able to see um, data on the actual votes cast, but ahead of the election, she was getting more votes from women than men um, in uh, the polls. And that's extraordinary when you consider that her father used to get two thirds of his votes from men. So she has not just closed, but reversed a very substantial gender gap. And that is really significant. And the significance of that is perhaps exemplified by the fact that that gender gap still exists on the far right. When you look at um, Zamor's vote, um, he was still receiving more than two thirds of his votes from men. So she took away the women who had perhaps more moderate inclinations and captured that electoral market, whilst um, the men who were attracted by the very outspoken, the anti-feminist discourse of Zamor um, stuck with him. Um, in contrast, um, Emmanuel Macron, um, obviously the, the man in the race, um, tried to portray himself as a feminist, tried to make women's rights a, a big part of his initial cancona, and then tried to um, pitch it as a big deal again in the second election. Um, and he has done a few things as a uh, president. He's taken action on things like um, street harassment. Um, he's extended um, legislation on, on gender quotas, um, but generally his track record on women's rights has been considered underwhelming to put it mildly. And um, this is perhaps exemplified by the, the headlines this week 
where he has made some positive noise by appointing a female prime minister for only the second time in France's history. And the first female prime minister, uh, Edith Cresson, you had to go back to, to 1991 under François Mitterrand. And um, one of her main distinctions was to be the shortest serving prime minister of the Fifth Republic. So um, she uh, was not in office long enough for most people even to remember that she was ever there. Um, so that's something I guess to celebrate that uh, we now have a, a female prime minister, although of course if she doesn't win her seat in the legislatives then her, her position could very quickly become undermined. Um, and if Macron doesn't get a majority then he loses the power to appoint the prime minister. So she could uh, easily uh, eclipse um, Cresson for, for lack of longe the longevity. But um, more striking is that only three days into her term as, as prime minister, uh, Macron's already being hit by a scandal and for the, for the third time in his presidency, uh, where one of his male ministers has been accused of sexual assault and he has failed again to dismiss that uh, minister from his cabinet, arguing innocent until proven guilty. But that has left a bad taste in the mouths of um, many female voters who feel that you know, he, he talks the talk, but won't walk the walk. So that leaves the sort of concluding question of what matters more to French voters. Is it descriptive or substantive representation? So descriptive representation would be having a woman represent them as president, whereas substantive representation would be having someone who represents their needs and interests. And um, on paper, one would argue that Macron's policies were probably the more feminist. But we can see that there was a certain appreciation of descriptive representation. That those policies sounded more authentic when articulated by a female candidate. And I'll stop there. That was wonderful. Thank you. Everybody kept to time beautifully, which means that we now have 15 minutes uh, for questions or commentary. What I suggest is that um, I'll see, I'll see what the enthusiasm is at the beginning, because sometimes it can take a little while for people to put their hands up. Uh, but if you put an X in the chat or if you raise your hand, I've already got Andrew on my list. Anybody else? We might take a couple at once. Anybody else? No. Nope. Otherwise, Andrew, the floor is yours. OK, just, a, just one or two things. Uh, Rainbow, you mentioned, I think, um, a pre-election poll, which I guess was Ipsos. Um, EFOP about which I heard rather less, but EFOP did do a, a Sortie des Urnes uh, poll, which is which is worth looking at, and I think had a sample of about 4,000, um, and it, which came out with more or less the same results as Ipsos. There weren't, there weren't radical differences. Um, also, I think Macron started his presidency by saying, if you're me on examen, you are out of the government. Um, that has since been spectacularly battu en brèche by the justice minister himself, who is currently me on examen, um, but has been reappointed. Um, remains to see what happens with Damien Abad. Um, Francoise, I was interested in, the, the Euro, in your comments about Mélenchon's coalition and the noops. The stress is there it seems to me are most likely to come out at the European elections two years from now, when there will be proportional representation, when the disagreements about Europe are likely to come open and, um, and there's no real incentive for the parties at this point to campaign as part of a group. Finally, um, Edouard Philippe, and horizon and parties. And this is something that I'm a bit unsure about. I rarely do political interviews, but Edouard Philippe, uh, when I did talk to, and he said to me, Macron is the first president of the Fifth Republic who doesn't understand what a party is. Um, and Philippe, I suppose, thinks he does and thinks he's trying to build a proper organization. And I'm still not absolutely sure whether um, who's got it right, whether Macron's got it right. He's got a minimal party. That's all he needs. He doesn't want a party that questions him, that passes motions, that has congresses in any meaningful way. So actually, he's absolutely fine, or whether it's Philippe and the old parties who want something structured with roots. 
I really don't know, I'm not sure. Thank you. So Rainbow, first of all, caught my first uh, time zone miscalculation. We have 45 minutes for questions. Um, I'm gonna have to keep doing this mental math in my head. Um, I can see that Sue's got a question too. I wasn't sure, Rainbow, if you wanted to um, speak back to any of these points or if we take Sue's point and see if we can um, kind of group them together. I'm just going to say thank you and pass to Sue. No problem at all. Sue, all yours. Uh, mine was just in response to um, your last comment, Andy, about um, Edouard Philippe and parties and things. It seems to me I've read an awful lot about um, Philippe um, sort of slagging off the appareil des parties, you know, the sort of uh, the party machinery being the thing that gets in the way. Um, and that seems to be, you know, within the LR as well, lots of people are kind of slagging off the party machinery, like they don't kind of want to have to deal with that anymore. Macron has kind of shown that you kind of can dispense with all of that. Um, so I, I, yeah, I'm just not sure what Edouard Philippe is kind of um, planning, but um, seems to me he said quite a lot about, you know, old party machinery is not really being the route he's going to go down. Although he was Secretary General of Les Républicains. Um, well, it suited his purpose, presumably. Yeah. yeah. May, I, may I come in, uh, Emily? Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. Yeah. Of course, party organizations, you know, are not what they used to be. And uh, with the fluidity of the electorate as well, uh, is another element. People are, um, electorates are much more volatile than they used to be. Uh, they tend to, you know, make that decision, voting decision uh, at the last minute more and more. And, uh, and party organizations are losing members, uh, you know, in, in a big way. So the type of parties that, uh, you know, used to uh, be the, the main structure for, uh, for elections and that in, I guess, the second half of the 20th century, um, I've been almost hollowed out in effect. Um, so it, it is possible then for somebody like Macron or you know, somebody like Berlusconi back in Italy uh, uh, to, to, some, you know, to form an organization, a movement, and then uh, change its name, uh, you know, like Macron did already after five years, uh, rebrand the party and, uh, um, and you know, still manage to, you know, to have a lot of support. So I think maybe um, um, Philippe, uh, obviously he is aware that there are benefits uh, to be gained from having people on the ground that you can count on if he claims to have 200 and some committees already established locally. And so if he's, uh, made that comment that you mentioned, so uh, perhaps it's a you know, kind of manipulative way of him to pretend that um, he's not doing what he's actually doing. But I think we have to remember that party organizations have weakened quite a lot uh, in recent times. And with social media and, uh, you know, people have much looser attachments and not, have not don't feel the loyalty they used to feel for a certain party, you know, where you know, family attachment or because your family always voted that way, therefore you couldn't contemplate possibly voting for the other party. That kind of thing, I think in the new generation of voters is not, uh, it's not uh, very, uh, very established. Yeah, I, sorry. Yeah, do it next. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you very much for this very interesting round table. I had two questions I wanted to, to raise to the whole uh, panel uh, more generally. The first one builds on, on what we were just talking about, this uh, kind of decline in parties, uh, and it's about the role of charismatic leadership. The main three blocks that we met, that we talked about, whether, they, whether it is Macron, Le Pen, or, or Mélenchon, are all held together by um, a strong leader in a way that, uh, that, that, that build most of the allegiance through, through, through charisma. And my question is, uh, what do you think of that? Is that a is that, is that a symptom of a of a decline of a, of this party system? Is that is that is that something that is say contingent or contextual and that might uh, 
diminish uh, with other less personality collections like the regional, the, the, the European and so on. So that's my first question. And the second one is about the, the state of the center left. So all of these social liberals, the social dem democrats that are, that are a bit, uh, that, uh, that you've seen uh, being completely torn by uh, the Socialist Party's decision to join UPES and you know people like François, François Hollande, uh, Cazeneuve and Le Foll and so on that, are, that, that, that do not quite want to join Macron but are not willing to compromise in, uh, with Mélenchon. And uh, do you think this is going to lead to a sort of de facto alignment with Macron? Do you think this is, uh, they're just doomed to, uh, to be partyless for a while. I think it's an interesting clarification of uh, the Socialist Party to move to move clearly in the in the radical left side. But uh, I'm interested in what's going to happen uh, about, about these kind of uh, individuals. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Well, I suggest then we go through the panel again, maybe in order, um, and you can tackle both or one of Theo's questions. And I hope together we'll get an answer to both your questions. Theo Francoise, would you like to try first? Yeah, you are right, Theo. Um, these parties, these broad coalitions are, you know, led by charismatic leaders. And that was a good question. I don't have an answer about uh, what will happen to the Socialist Party in the future. But these charismatic sort of uh, groups or coalitions of parties, um, you know, there's a big question what will happen when those leaders go? Like, what will happen to uh, Macron's? Uh, coalition when he's no longer president. Uh, in fact, we might see already throughout the parliament this to manifest itself because uh, he's not going to run again according to the constitution. Hopefully he's not going to change that. <laughs> um, uh, and, and, and you are right, there is, a, a, I think, a democratic issue attached to the fact uh, that uh, these parties are led by these charismatic leaders. and. Uh, you know, yeah, on the left, uh, the Mélenchons, uh, La France Insoumise, is a very um, fragile, very loose kind of, um, almost a transactional uh, association of very disparate groups. Um, and so how long can actually he hold that, uh, that together um, to be an effective opposition? And the Socialist Party is very concerning. I mean, it does bounce back before, but this is a, a, real, um, a real collapse. And so for the Republicans too, but somehow I feel perhaps that the Republicans, if they kind of start aligning behind Edouard Philippe, we'll have to see what happens after the legislative election because it's all very uh, uh, strategic at the moment and he doesn't want to, uh, to push it too much. Um, uh, claiming to want to continue to support the presidential majority, what will happen after? Will he manage to um, um, uh, to co-opt the old structure of the Republican Party and effectively do what Sarkozy did? You know, rebrand the party on, on the surface but keep the, the existing structure. But for the Socialist Party, it, it is quite uh, quite concerning. But I understand there are about seventy. Um, candidates, I think, uh, who are dissidents, who are not wanting to join uh, Mélenchon's um, group. Um, so, you know, what will happen to them? Are they going to campaign uh, on their own uh, label? Because this is another thing, and I'm not sure I got the detail right, uh, but um, the, I think the Macron's candidate within that coalition have on their ballot papers or on their campaign literature, uh, the banner of Ensemble, uh, whereas uh, for the Mélenchon candidates, they are still running, I think their campaign brochures, and I, know, I could be wrong about that. Um, and the ballots, I think, the ballot papers, um, and hopefully somebody can correct me on that, but I seem to recall having read something, there was an issue here where for, for the Mélenchon's candidate, they were not uh, given the label of, uh, of, um, of the popular um, uh, union. Um, so, you know, if anybody has more information than me about this, I'm quite interested in hearing about it. 
Sue, anything to add on these questions? Um, yeah, um, you've got a couple of hands up. Should okay. I go first? Sure, it depends. Uh, I saw, so Malcolm, welcome. Your camera's just gone live. So I wonder maybe if you want to jump in. Otherwise, uh, Andrew, I've also got you just after Sue, if that's okay. Sure, if I can uh, go ahead. I simply wanted to uh, make, a, make a historical point about this question of uh, personalities uh, in presidential elections as opposed to, uh, to parties. And, and surely that was the way de Gaulle deliberately set up the, uh, the, the, the system uh, back in the uh, early, uh, early 60s. I mean, I always remember uh, seeing him talking and uh, he had great contempt, as you know, for, for parties. He almost spat out the word party. And, uh, you know, in a sense, isn't this uh, a tribute to uh, his uh, enduring legacy? Um, shall I come in now? Yeah, go for it, and then I'll keep Sue for it for the end. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, yes. Thank you for bringing De Gaulle in. Um, uh, certainly, really, if if you talk about Mélenchon, Macron, and Le Pen as charismatic lead leaders, boy, they they do not measure up. There is no way they measure up to the main man. Um, and they are all, I mean, it is true that de Gaulle was hated in his time, but all three, I think, of, the, of our current charismatic leaders, they, all right, they inspire a certain amount of, um, not quite adulation, but um, strong support among their loyalists, but they're also intensely disliked um, by large sectors of the electorate. Um, but okay, let's call them charismatic. And then the question is indeed, how, much, how long do their party organizations survive? With Ensemble, you have the absolute certainty of a succession struggle, which may indeed already have begun because Macron can't do a third term. With um, Noops, you have at least the distinct possibility of a succession struggle because of uh, Mélenchon's age. And I think it's fair to say there are one or two people within La France Insoumise who would quite like uh, a stronger leadership role for themselves. In uh, the Rassemblement National, um, it's perhaps a bit less certain because Marine Le Pen, after all, um, is only, I think, 53 years old um, and therefore could easily run again. The question is, particularly in the result, in the light of what may well happen in the legislative, whether there will be restiveness um, within the Rassemblement National about uh, Marine Le Pen, whether they really want her to have a fourth go at the presidency and whether people like Borrella will actually try to elbow them out. So there's lots of potential for instability there. To come back to Françoise's point about um, noops, I think it is that Mélenchon promised his partners um, the possibility of an independent parliamentary group so that there would be a socialist parliamentary group, a green parliamentary group, a communist parliamentary group, and the share out of constituencies and winnable seats is such that if they do well, there is the potential for each of the four organizations to have such a parliamentary group. And therefore, the interior ministry has said, well, if that is the case, we are not going to count um, NUPS candidates as NUPS candidates. They will be candidates of their specific organizations. Finally, in relation to NUPS, I think it's interesting that um, I think it's EFOP who've done one or two um, polls on what if the candidates for Greens, Communists and Socialists ran independently instead of under the NUPS umbrella. And EFOP suggests that actually the total would be slightly greater of the order of 30% instead of 
27% for the parties currently in Newt. However, of course, that would not necessarily translate, indeed it probably would not translate into a better result in terms of seats. Voila. Um, you want me to speak next? Um, okay, so yeah, um, I say to you, you've kind of qualified charismatic leadership as personality driven. I mean, it, it's very much a sign of our times, isn't it? You know, we need figures who can be on the telly and on social media and, you know, it's, um, it's kind of Berlusconi politics as well, isn't it? I mean, I think it's hard to get away from the fact that you can have a good leader and if they're not kind of good in, um, in presenting themselves visually, they're not really going to do well. I mean, look at François Hollande. <laughs> um, you know, the, the, the archetypal uncharismatic leader. Um, I was quite interested to see, I, back in the autumn, I bought this book. Um, I don't know if anyone else has read Affronté, uh, but Francois, I was kind of interested, why is he publishing a book now? You know, he published his kind of um, book, his anti-Macron book already. So what, what's, you know, what's this about? Um, and it read to me like one of those books that candidates publish before they're going to stand for a presidential election. And I thought, what's he doing? Because he's partly doing a kind of, oh, I got this wrong, but actually what we really need to do is this. And there was lots of that. And I was thinking, is he seriously thinking of making a comeback? Um, and then I read a very, article, a very interesting article in Le Monde and I saw on some TV interview with um, Julien Dre, that François Hollande was actually seriously um, planning to stand as candidate, assuming that Anne Hidalgo was going to withdraw because she was doing so badly. He'd actually got a campaign headquarters and a team um, and they were all ready to go as soon as she kind of pulled out. And then of course she didn't, she stuck in there. Um, so I found this quite incredible that he could imagine that he, would do any better than her. So in terms of sort of charismatic leadership, I think, you know, that there's, there's quite a lot going on there. But um, in terms of, um, so yeah, personality politics, he obviously thinks that, you know, he's got enough personality or something to be able to, to come back and revive the Socialist Party. But it's kind of under the label of, you know, the, you know, it's what the gauche de gouvernement, what do they call it? Gauche gouvernementale, you know, the socialisme. So what is that? And that's what he did when he was president. And that's kind of basically what kind of finalised the split of the party, isn't it? You know, kind of, so what's, what, what him and his, you know, there are a bunch of people who are behind Hollande, um, who want to kind of hold on to the old socialist party. It's got a name, it's got a brand, it's got a history, all of that stuff. They want to kind of hold on to that. But how, can, how are they going to be able to differentiate what they stand for from what Macron's doing, really? Um, even though, you know, the, the more Macron moves to the right, I suppose, the easier that becomes. Um, but um, I, I honestly think that he still somewhere in the back of his mind thinks that he could make a comeback in 2027. Um, <laughs> bizarre though that might seem. Um, also 2027, you know, um, in terms of personality politics, well, uh, as, as somebody said, will Mélenchon still be there? Will Le Pen be there? Who will be the charismatic leaders in 2027? This is presumably, as you said, Andy, which is where Edouard Philippe plans on coming in and cashing in the popularity that he had as prime minister. Um, I don't think we're going to get away from personality driven leadership of parties. I think the days of, you know, ideas and all of that stuff um, have pretty much gone. It's Elodie, always, you may have something different to say. Yeah. It's always reminds me every five years that I would watch this. I would watch this as a TV show. You know, I would watch a lot of French politics TV show maybe because I'm in Denmark now. And we do, you know, very good uh, political TV. Uh, but all of this is very soap opera esque, with the 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 headquarters prepared, ready to go in case somebody drops out. 
Um, there's a few comments that have been added to the chat as well. Uh, Andy's um, commented on the, the notion of charismatic leadership, um, but unless anybody wants to jump in on that particular point, I've got Elodie up next. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know, Emily, if you've seen Baron Noir, but that's a TV series about French politics. Uh, I'll have to watch it. Perfect. <laughs> that might be something. Um, and to remind you of, of, of some uh, specific characters. Uh, but thank you very much to, to all the presenters. And I have uh, one question that's for Rainbow, uh, and then uh, more a general question maybe to the panel. And that's pretty much a, a bit follow up on the, uh, the sort of gender discussion we've had about division of men, like uh, François Hollande, who think they can go on forever. Uh, but it's also a more general point about the impact of quotas. Uh, France has had gender quotas for quite some time, and yet when you look at all the parties, there aren't that many women in high positions of leadership. So you, you've mentioned uh, Hidalgo and Pécresse, but they're a bit like the Smurfette, you know, the, the one girl in the village. Uh, if, if, if you saw Valérie Pécresse uh, on the stage, it was her and a bunch of men. Uh, and obviously there's the uh, exception of, of uh, Marie Le Pen, but then if you look again at um, La République En Marche, even though at the very start when they were trying to get people to be candidates, Macron made a specific video. We have lost energy in what I suspect is probably a uh, technical failure. So I'm sure she'll be back, unless you can all see her and I can't. Um, but otherwise what I suggest is, oh, she's back. I'm sorry, my uh, office computers decided that it was time to restart. I think this is the um, one thing about doing a webinar two years uh, into or after, however you want to frame it, a pandemic. We're all much more relaxed when it comes to technical failures. Can anyone hear me? Yeah. Carry on. Because I, I see Emily move lips moving, but I can't actually hear you her. You can't hear me. Well, let me send a message to you. We can hear you. There we go. Sorry. Uh, thank goodness my laptop was on as well. Uh, so, yeah, so, uh, you know, um, looking at La République en Marche, on the other hand, yeah, early, early in the days, Macron made a video specifically to encourage women to apply, acknowledging some of the systemic hurdles they might face, etc. But then the, we haven't really seen any interest in sort of fostering women into positions uh, of leadership. And instead, it had to pluck someone who's not even in parliament to become um, MP, uh, sorry, Prime Minister. Uh, I mean, I'm not suggesting I want Marlene Schiappa Prime Minister, but there, there were women out there, but that's not them who've been uh, put in, in this sort of uh, off position. So I do wonder whether that you were, you were talking about symbolic and um, other different types of, of representation. And I do wonder really about what your thoughts are about the, the actual impact of having gender quotas uh, on women in French politics, in particular in higher positions in French politics. And then I've got a more general question about uh, uh, for the panel. Uh, you've been talking about the, uh, so I, I really don't know if you're supposed to say NUPES or NUPES or NUP, uh, but um, whether the Jospin's gauche plurielle could be a, a, a sort of a, a good example, if we think, I've heard a lot of people saying, what happens next? Well, what happened next with that gauche plurielle is that everyone stayed who they were. All the parties kept existing and went on to campaign again, et cetera. So I was wondering if you thought that could be an interesting comparison or parallel. Thank you. I'll let you take the question first, Rainbow, and then we can revisit the panel for the second one. Um, thank you very much. Um, so I've been used to giving a lot of uh, media answers to questions where you come up with a sort of uh, 10 second soundbite response to something. Um, so today I'm gonna to indulge myself and give an academic answer. So what is the impact of gender crisis on French politics? Um, I've just got a grant now to, to spend next year writing a book on it. So come back to me in 18 months and I'll have a book to answer that question for you. Um, <laughs> uh, but in, no, on, a, on a more serious note, um, one of the things that has become clear over the last two decades is that uh, feminization of politics has to be about more than just numbers. Um, it has to be about empowerment. 
And it has become clear that empowerment has followed more slowly than numbers. That we have seen consistently that even when women are present, they are not taking on the leadership positions. For example, uh, we've never had a female president of the Assemblée Nationale or of the Sena. Um, until last week, we'd only ever had a Cresson as prime minister. We still see that there are certain ministries within the government that are generally uh, the reserve of men. We see that on parliamentary committees, the more prestigious parliamentary committees are still male dominated, um, right down to the, um, the teams surrounding Macron at the Elysee, which is still very male dominated. So we have a, a certain increase in, in numbers, but we certainly don't have parity of political power and that's still a work in progress. And on that note, um, I will move to somewhat to answer um, Francois's question as well in, in the notes about um, the new government. Uh, we're seeing once again, um, a certain gender distribution of labor. So since Francois Hollande, we've had gender parity in the government that's now become uh, what some of my gender politics colleagues would call a concrete floor that once you've established a precedent of having a certain proportion of women in government, it then looks bad to fall below that precedent. So that's now become a sort of a soft norm that we have uh, parity of women in the government, but we see consistently that they are in less powerful positions, generally speaking, than men. And we see here once again that the majority of the uh, regalian positions have, have gone to men. Uh, we do have a female um, Minister for Europe and Foreign Affairs, which is, is progress, but uh, as is mostly the case, we see, you know, a man holding um, finance, we see a man holding defence, we see a man holding interior, um, and, you know, controversy there as well. Um, and as for the Prime Minister herself, um, obviously it's very exciting to see a, a woman at, at Matignon, but it's very clear from this appointment that this is not a government of equals, uh, that she is very, very clearly appointed to be a subordinate to Macron. Um, and in fact, that was part of the point of the appointment that he, he nominated someone that he knew would not take any of his limelight, that owes her political career to him, that has no real independent political power that is loyal, that will implement his program and that is dispensable at any point where he decides to reshuffle. So um, yes, she has a certain degree of status now conferred upon her as prime minister, but uh, she is certainly not going to be someone to challenge him or to be, I don't think, a prospective successor to Macron. Um, in fact, at the moment, looking within his party, I don't see any obvious female prospects to succeed Macron as the leader of the party. Um, so some progress, but still a long way to go. I think we're all very excited to read the book at Rainbow and definitely add it to our syllabi as well. I think it'd probably be excellent. Um, so I've got Theo up next, but does anybody on the, yes, I can see Andrew wants to jump in on this question. So if anybody else wants to jump in, just let me know. Um, so I've got Andrew and then Francois, and then I'll come back to you too. No worries. I, I, I just wanted to say that I don't, I mean, my, my answer was, a come back, was, a, was going back to what we were talking about before on Charisma. I don't want to, to bring back the discussion from the topic where we are at. So yeah. many other people come and if there's some time uh, at some point later, I'm happy to talk about no, no priority. Andrew? Um, yes, the charismatic stuff. Um, look at Weber. Um, it's, it, I think it's, what's it, politics? I mean, okay, well, if you open the, the floor here, I, so I work on performance in politics. I work also on populism and, and I've written a whole chapter on, on, on charismatic leadership and I use Weber, of course, but Weber's definition, I would argue, is charisma is a gift of, a gift of God, a gift of grace, if you go back to etymology. And technically, Mélenchon, uh, at least Mélenchon, and, and potentially even Macron could fit, still fit in that category. But I, I'm more interested in this notion of incarnation or embodiment, uh, this idea that politics needs a sort of like a recipient to, for ideas to, 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 to be given shape. Reversal. I'm not as interested, of course, in, in, in you know, this idea of, of what charisma does, but it is a great and huge debate, right? On, but uh, I, I'm fascinated by seeing that in, in politics, and I'm and I and I'm very happy for that. Malcolm brought back the, the notion of this is this is rooted in in the goals way of doing politics, which was personalistic and which was. But uh, anyway, sorry, I didn't mean to 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 interrupt. But it is. Uh, I'm fascinated by this, and I'm very interested in. So thank you for recommending that there again. 
This is Thank the you. joy of being between friends is that we can take these little segments. Um, um, yeah, de, one thing about de Gaulle and one thing about the gauche plurielle, um, de Gaulle and parties, great contempt for parties, but if you look at um, the diaries of uh, Jacques Focard, um, I think before the municipal elections of 1965, de Gaulle has about 20 meetings with Focard, going over the candidates, town after town after town. You know, he may not have liked parties, he didn't like his own party, but boy, did he look to see who was there and who was running. Um, gauche plurielle, yes, good comparison. Um, I think I'm right in saying, but I may be wrong, that the gauche plurielle in 97 didn't run a single candidate in each constituency um, at the first ballot. I'm not absolutely sure about that, but it seems to me that one of the innovations of NUPS is actually that they are running, of course, then there are the dissidents, but they are running one NUPS candidate in the first ballot across France. And they have to, because there's a very high level of abstention expected, and it is therefore unlikely that there are going to be more than a tiny handful of triangulaires. So that in that respect, NUPS looks rather more of a block than the gauche plurielle. Um, I'm a little bit puzzled because we're sort of so, you know, NUPS is quite an innovation. Nobody was really expecting it. And I'm quite surprised that the polls don't really show left-wing voters being very convinced by it. They don't look any more likely to go out and vote than your average voter, perhaps because so many Mélenchon voters were younger. But there doesn't seem to be a sort of extra dynamic that's built behind NUPS despite this not inconsiderable achievement. Other difference with the gauche plurielle is of course that with the gauche plurielle, the center of gravity was towards the moderate end of the coalition, whereas with NUPS, it's towards the radical end. And this doesn't seem to me necessarily a very good recipe for winning in the future, because where are the extra votes going to come from to come up from 28% up into the 30s, which would be necessary to win? Logically, they would come from the center left, the center, but um, Mélenchon is rather a repoussant figure for those people. Uh, there's a chunk of the center left that's already said they don't want anything to do with nukes. So that as well as the internal tensions we've talked about, it seems to me that there's a rather a sort of wall around the NUPS electorate that I can't see quite how it's going to expand. Thank you. Thanks very much, Francoise. Yes, it was just in reaction to uh, the cabinet, the women in cabinet uh, that uh, Rainbow uh, uh, kindly addressed the question. I, um, I thought there were two women appointed for environment related uh, portfolios. I was just looking now. So Florence Parly, no, sorry, for, uh, yeah, Barbara Pompey as environment minister. And of course, the prime minister herself as, uh, as uh, uh, I think, a special responsibility for ensuring the, the ecological transition and so on. But I think there was another, there was another, maybe it's uh, lower level person also related to the environment. There is an Annick Girardin minister for the sea. Well, that's uh, uh, related to environment. Another woman as minister for regional cohesion. Well, it's kind of a loose uh, um, portfolio, but uh, 
So I was just thinking if, uh, if we take the rainbows um, a comment to its logical conclusion that um, Macron only appoints men mainly in the regalian ministries, but women uh, in others, a less important portfolio. What does that say about his commitment to, to the environment and uh, his ecological agenda for, for, for the next five years? But I don't expect any, any answers, it's just a, um, a comment really. Um, yes. Rainbow? Um, Yes, so there are there are two portfolios, uh, both held by women. One for um, energy transition, um, if you will, um, or environmental trend. Uh, yeah, one for environmental transition and uh, territorial cohesion, and then a separate one for energy transition, which obviously is also uh, linked to the environment. But um, I think Macron has known for a while that he has to do better. On the environment that's been a bit of an Achilles heel for him and one where Mélenchon has been able to sweep up disaffected voters. Um, so one thing that's kind of interesting now is looking at um, what people who supported Jadot and uh, the, the Green candidate in the presidential election are, are looking to do for the parliamentary elections. And whereas, um, you know, some of the other parties have, have uh, pretty much transferred their loyalty to to Nup, um, Nupes. Um, we see that Jada's uh, voters are more torn. Um, so some of them are willing to go to Macron, um, and some of them to to Nupes. Um, but I think I think Macron has dragged his feet on the environment for five years and been punished for it. So even though you could say, well, you know, he's nominated women, that's generally a sign of contempt. Uh, I think I think he is going to do a bit better in this in this five year term, just because he, he can't afford not to. I think he knows there's going to be some uh, retaliation on this if he doesn't. And um, he, you know, his, his promises in the election were still underwhelming. So I don't think he's suddenly going to be the great new environmental leader but I think to you know compared to some of the other challenges that he's facing and the cost of living crisis the war in Ukraine that he has quite limited ability to turn those things around um, whereas with the environment he can at least score a few wins so uh, I'm, I'm maybe I'm just this sort of optimistic talking here but I'd, I'd like to see him do at least something um, uh, and one thing just to follow up on that is that uh, it's notable that there isn't a, a full minister for women um, in this particular government. And, and that's something that's uh, come and gone over the previous presidencies. We've seen women's rights promoted to ministry status and demoted to uh, sort of substatus. And at the moment it's substatus, which is disappointing. That's really Really interesting. We've still got three minutes if somebody's got, I see Andrew, yep, yeah, your hand and then Sue. So we'll do Andrew and then finish with Sue. Perfect. Okay. Quick one to Rainbow. I remember 15 years ago, I think it was that long, um, you were, you suggested that Ségolène Royal had been penalized as a candidate for being a woman. Um, I, I don't know about Marine Le Pen. She's a bit of an exception because of her surname. But I wonder if you would think um, that that has been true of Anne Hidalgo and of Valérie Pécresse, both of whom bombed. Sorry, and one other tiny thing, we haven't talked about Les Républicains. Um, they are polling at 10% at the moment. That is a not negligible percentage. It will be interesting to see what happens to them. I don't know if you want to properly answer that, Rainbow, or we just we consider that a theme that we will carry on. Um, um, I'll respond briefly. Yeah, sure. I don't think we've seen the same sort of full scale uh, sort of uh, sexist rejection of a female candidate that we saw with Segment Royal, where there were a lot of um, gender related tropes about her. I think there has been a growing normalization of women in leadership roles. 
I think that uh, Hidalgo's difficulty in establishing her credibility as a candidate was, was partly gender related. And I think uh, uh, Pekres suffered from the invasion of Ukraine. I think the rallying around the flag was accentuated by a, a sort of a, a leaning towards a more masculine leadership. But I think that what we saw in uh, 2007 with Hoya was more clear cut. And I think the questions are now more nuanced. Um, and I'll, I'll keep it brief, so I'll stop there. That was very brief and very succinct. Um, so can I go? Absolutely. Yeah, so just two quick points and then a question. So just on the uh, Rainbow Coalition thing, of course, 97 didn't follow a presidential result. So, you know, the Mélenchon, the Noop thing is very much in the wake of the Elan Présidentiel, isn't it? So I think that's quite different to 97. The second thing is on, on the kind of, on the green policies, you know, it seems to me there's a huge problem about whether you, you know, nuclear power, is it green? <laughs> The EU is now having to, you know, they've kind of, you know, sat on the fence about this, haven't they? So, I mean, Macron came out, if you remember, it was just literally days after the, the Republican debate about, you know, with the candidates, and they all said how many nuclear power stations they were going to build. And then he suddenly came out after five years and said, oh, yeah, I'm going to build, I can't remember how many, or it was four or five or something. So he suddenly came out in favour of new nuclear power stations. And I mean, is nuclear power a green energy? I think that's quite an important question that's going to be kind of at the heart of some of the stuff. And it's going to tip over into all the European things as well. Um, I have a question which um, I don't know if colleagues can help me with. Um, so we know that about half of the current government is standing for election. I've lost track of the rules. It seems to me that certainly under Hollande, um, ministers were expected to stand uh, and win a seat in the Assemblée Nationale if they wanted to keep their place in the government. Um, what's the position now? Seems that Macron's kind of rather kind of let that go. Does that, can anyone? What's the deal on whether you have to or not? It's not a requirement, right? Constitution. No, it's not. No, no, it isn't. But exactly. um, but certainly, it had become more of a kind of, you know, you had to prove your credentials as a minister by winning a seat first, and then you let it go to your, um, you know, Supreme. your yeah. your Supreme. Mm. You had to just prove your your credentials in a sense. I, am I right in thinking that Hollande made all his ministers stand? In 2012? That, do you know what that sounds to That sounds like a wonderful homework for the next 30 minutes when we have a break. Yeah. And the opportunity to Google, like. I, I don't know where to look it up. I don't know how to look that up. I will try for you, Sue, while I have a. Oh, that would be great. I'd like to try to find the answer for you. That would be great. In the meantime, um, if there's no other burning questions, then this, I think we can, we can come to a very successful end to our first round table today. Thank you very much to everybody, panelists, but also the rest of you who, uh, who participated. We need uh, first to thank uh, our panelists uh, for, for joining us. Uh, and before I introduce them, uh, the first one, let me just uh, give a little caveat. Uh, according to our schedule, then we have um, the first paper was going to be presented by Mike um, uh, Louis Bag, that all of you know, I'm sure, uh, is the eminence gris of uh, regression analysis. Uh, for election uh, analysis and uh, forecasting and has a great interest in French politics and French elections has published widely about this and sent us a really interesting um, uh, presentation uh, on a paper that uh, he has co-authored with uh, several others. Uh, unfortunately, Mike is uh, fighting a cold at the moment. He wanted to uh, spare mm -hmm. us the um, is uh, is coughs and uh, and uh, he sneezes and so uh, ask whether any of his co-authors could uh, step in in his place. Unfortunately, none of them are available. But Rainbow has kindly agreed uh, to uh, share um, um, or at least talk, talk us through some of his slides, which are quite comprehensive. So. 
I will ask her later um, to step in, but uh, she has to first we need a little bit. I'm, of I'm actually good to go. Good to go whenever you need me to. Sorry. I'm good to go whenever you need me to do okay. it. Actually. Well, let's let's yeah we we'll, we we'll go. Uh, we'll, we'll take you uh, uh, in second place and uh, Rainbow, if you don't mind. So then Malcolm uh, Hook uh, is uh, Emeritus Professor of French History at Kiel University. Mike, uh, reti Malcolm retired in 2014 and continues his research in French history. Last year, he published a book uh, with Oxford University Press entitled How the French Learned to Vote, A History of Electoral Practice in France. And uh, hopefully he's going to share some of that knowledge with us today during his talk on how the French voted in the presidential elections 2022. Uh, then we have uh, Helen, Helen Drake, a well-known uh, scholar of French politics in the UK. Uh, Helen is professor of French and European studies at Loughborough University and director of the Institute for Diplomacy and International Governance. She also holds a chair in uh, French and European studies uh, at Loughborough University. She will talk to us about Franco-British relations, the relationship uh, that has had its ups and downs, uh, a lot more downs recently than ups, uh, a series of very contentious issues have uh, um, tested the Entente Cordiale recently. Um, so I'm looking forward to hearing about that as I'm sure you are. And then we have John Ryan, who is a professor uh, in a network, research, a network research fellow at the CS CIFO in Munich. He was previously a fellow at LSE Ideas at St. Edmunds College, University of Cambridge, and the German Institute for International Security Affairs in Berlin. Uh, he also does consider work, I believe, from uh, what I've been able to establish uh, online. And uh, John is going to uh, talk about global policy shifts, uh, Macron positions France as leading ally in Europe. So if, um, so we, we'll take uh, Malcolm first, then Rainbow, and then Helen and John, if that's all right with you. And meanwhile, uh, people uh, want to come into the discussion of questions, please uh, write your questions uh, in uh, the chat box, or if they are really uh, confidential, you can use the Q&A on, on Zoom, but I think the chat box has worked very well so far this morning, so uh, hopefully we'll continue. So each, each person, each participant has 10 minutes, if you could uh, adhere to that time frame, that I would be uh, very appreciative. Um, so, uh, without further ado, then um, we'll take our first speaker. Okay, I'll uh, share the screen. Yeah. Uh, hoping that will uh, right. come up. There we uh, there we go. Okay. Well, thank you uh, very much indeed for uh, giving me the opportunity to uh, say a few words about uh, voting in these uh, presidential uh, elections. Five years ago, uh, I, uh, out of the blue, I got a call from the BBC asking me to, uh, to comment uh, on uh, the uh, enormous number of spoiled votes that were cast in 2017. Uh, this time I was, uh, I was well prepared, but uh, no call came. So uh, I'm very pleased to, uh, to have a chance to uh, say something about the subject uh, now. But uh, I also want to, uh, to say something about uh, abstention, with which I'll uh, begin. Uh, and then after I've uh, said a few words about uh, spoiled uh, ballot papers, the uh, blanc et nul, uh, I'll uh, go on to say a, a few brief words about the uh, uh, political geography revealed by, uh, by these elections. So there are almost 49 million voters in uh, France at the moment, registered voters. And uh, basically, I want to discuss their differing responses to the opportunity they were given to participate in the uh, presidential uh, election uh, on uh, April the 10th uh, and April the, uh, the 20, uh, 24th. Let me uh, start by, uh, by talking uh, about those uh, who uh, didn't vote at all. 
Uh, I'm not quite sure how can I can I move on. Uh, I don't know if Tarmida is there can help me just move on the uh, the slides. Not quite sure how to uh, how no. to do that. Can Malcolm, you... I can't do that for you because you're sharing your screen. But if you click on the next slide on the left hand side. Yeah. Okay, yep. that's uh, that's great. Yeah. So to start off by uh, by talking about uh, non uh, non voting. Now I'm I'm sure you're aware. Uh, that uh, since the, uh, the last couple of decades of the uh, the last century, the uh, level of abstention has uh, generally been uh, rising uh, in uh, elections everywhere, uh, and that includes uh, France. Uh, however, as you can see from this uh, graphic, uh, the phenomenon has been much less marked in presidential elections in France than it has in the uh, parliamentary elections. Uh, Macron's camp was uh, especially worried about non-voting this time, but in the event, although there was a fall compared to uh, 2017 to uh, 74% and 72% in the uh, in the two rounds, uh, as you can see from this table, it hardly represented uh, a dramatic uh, decline uh, of the sort which uh, clearly occurred in the uh, the last round of uh, legislative. Uh, elections. Nonetheless, I think it's significant uh, that uh, French politicians uh, remain very concerned about this uh, downward trend, uh, as they have been in fact uh, throughout the, uh, the history of uh, elections uh, in France. Uh, not only uh, uh, has uh, the, uh, there been further decline this time, but I think it uh, appears to be the case that uh, the days of regular 80% plus turnout in uh, French presidential uh, elections uh, is uh, is over. Uh, and uh, I've got another slide here, which uh, just gives you uh, an idea of the uh, of the figures. And as you can see, uh, less than 80% uh, uh, was uh, was a rarity. 1969, a glaring exception to that uh, that rule. But uh, in this century. Uh, less than 80% uh, has, uh, has become uh, very much the rule and uh, uh, of late it's uh, dipping down towards the 70% uh, uh, mark. So that does appear to be uh, an ongoing uh, shift. But equally interesting, I think, uh, is the uh, geography of, of uh, abstention. Well into the 20th century, it was the more developed areas of France that voted more heavily. Whereas these days, some of the most abstentionist departments are to be found in the former industrial heartlands of the Northeast. By contrast, once pole-shy Brittany now rec records rather higher levels of turnout. And we can see this uh, on a map. I'm sorry, it's uh, a little bit uh, faint, but you can see the north, uh, Northeast there uh, very heavily uh, abstentionist in the, uh, the second round. Uh, also, uh, the uh, Mediterranean departments, they've uh, long been uh, uh, a bit pole shy. And, and of course, also uh, those uh, overseas departments and uh, Sue Collard reminded us earlier that that goes for the uh, expatriate uh, French in their constituencies as well. It's worth uh, stressing in commenting on the, uh, the nature of abstention that the number of those who uh, who don't vote at all, uh, who are chiefly to be found among the uh, the young and the marginalised, is relatively small, at around uh, ten percent of the electorate. So the uh, the recent and current uh, fall in turnout is very much the uh, result of people voting intermittently rather than regularly. And in their case, non-voting should not be automatically equated with indifference. Indeed, one or two political scientists have argued that uh, intermittent voting is actually a sign of vitality because it can be seen as a conscious choice by voters who are often politically well informed and well educated. But instead of habitually, perhaps mechanically, turning out from one election to the next, they've been deciding whether or not to vote on a poll by poll basis. And of course, uh, their reluctance to turn out is uh, politically, uh, particularly apparent 
in the second round of the two ballot presidential system. Abstention then in round two is not so much the result of apathy as a lack of attraction to the two remaining candidates. Having said that, in 2022, the number of non-voters rose by less than a million between rounds one and two. What decisively reduced the number of valid votes at the second tour was the level of spoiling from less than a million in round one to over three million in round two, the second highest uh, figure on record. You can see on the uh, slide there. So uh, what we're uh, witnessing is the fact that a month ago on the 24th of April, roughly one in 12 of those French voters who took the trouble to visit a polling station did so in order to cast a vote that they knew would have no effect on the electoral outcome. The insertion of a blank piece of paper into the envelope, which the voter must carefully prepare at home, since bulletin blanc are not available at the polling station, like the easier option of simply dropping an empty envelope into the ballot box, is a quite deliberate act. In many ways, it reflects that uh, key demand on uh, French uh, citizens, uh, which is uh, to insist that uh, voting isn't simply a right, but it's also a duty. Although perhaps uh, these days, more and more people are uh, uh, exploiting their right not to vote rather than to do so. Now these uh, bulletins are rightly counted in the turnout, even though they don't contribute to the, uh, the outcome. The, this practice has uh, a long history and it takes many forms, but I would highlight uh, those spoiled papers proper where the candidate's name has been crossed out or comments have been added. In fact, it's also possible for uh, candidates to appear in the, uh, in the ballot box who were not on the list for election. Thus, uh, Mélenchon received numerous invalid votes in the second round, like the recently deceased nationalist uh, Ivan Colonna in uh, Corsica. Defaced or uh, annotated papers constitute only a minority of invalidated ballots, but they become more visit visible of late because these days they can be photographed on mobile phones and then disseminated on the internet. Such publicity may well be uh, encouraging other voters to, uh, to do the same. And some newspapers and websites actually compete to reproduce the most uh, extreme examples. So let's just uh, have a look at uh, one or two of them very, uh, very briefly from last uh, month. Uh, this one, as you can see, uh, has been uh, fabricated uh, as uh, Marine uh, Macron. And uh, basically what that's uh, saying is uh, on the part of the, uh, the voter, I don't have a, a real choice. They're both the same. Ni l'un, ni l'autre, which is uh, what uh, some people will, uh, will write on their, uh, on their paper. Um, another uh, example here is uh, making comments uh, about... Uh, a candidate uh, suggesting that uh, poor old uh, Valerie, this was in the first round, will need uh, some help with financing her campaign, which of course proved to be uh, prophetically uh, true. Uh, and then last of all, you get these uh, sort of stray mentions. This one uh, is uh, a vote in favour of the, uh, the French international footballer, Karim uh, Benzema. Um, so, we often uh, say that uh, when we're voting, we are expressing an opinion, but in actual fact, that's, that's not true. All we're doing is merely choosing between the candidates on offer. So as you can see from these very limited examples, some uh, voters refuse to choose, while for others, annotation is a way of making a political point. It may also be done in a, a very playful fashion. But I think the uh, increase in spoiling, like the increase uh, in uh, Blanc, 
Bulletin Blanc is deeply disturbing for the, uh, the French political class because it questions their legitimacy and uh, above all perhaps uh, it violates the sanctity of the electoral process which uh, I've always thought is taken a lot more seriously in France than it is uh, in the uh, United Kingdom. Well finally let's uh, come to uh, a few remarks uh, uh, about uh, the way in which the, uh, the uh, two-thirds of the electorate uh, cast legitimate balance ballots in these uh, elections. Um, let's turn very briefly to the bulletin that actually uh, actually counted. Uh, I won't say much about this because uh, it's already been uh, been mentioned, uh, not uh, least by uh, by Andrew. But in terms of uh, political geography, I think these maps uh, demonstrate quite clearly that uh, Macron's support emanates from the uh, more traditionally conservative regions of France that have voted very much for the centre-right in the past. Well, you can see with the, uh, the blue there that much of Le Pen's strength is concentrate, concentrated in areas which uh, used to have a, a left-wing tradition. Uh, but have now uh, shifted to uh, the other side of the political uh, spectrum. And then finally, there's the uh, example of uh, Paris and the, uh, the area around Paris, which gave a majority to uh, Mélenchon uh, in, the, uh, in the first round, which then uh, passed to uh, Macron in the, uh, in the second. I'll just give you a, a brief uh, look at that. Uh, one, one point that uh, I would just briefly like to, uh, to make is, is the way in which uh, the overseas voters uh, flipped from uh, being uh, voters in a majority for uh, Mélenchon in the first round, but uh, then uh, voted for uh, Le Pen in the, uh, in the second. Uh, and that, I think, is, is very symptomatic of general disaffection and, and wanting to, uh, to vote against the, uh, the establishment, against the status quo, which of course Macron uh, had very much come to uh, incarnate after his first term uh, in, uh, in office. I must stop there, so as a final comment, I will uh, simply say that uh, in 2017, when it came to the uh, legislative uh, elections, for the first time since 1848, turnout absolutely collapsed to below 50% of registered voters. Voter fatigue is evidently uh, taking a toll in what have become effectively the third and fourth rounds of voting for the, uh, the national representation. My uh, guess is this time it won't be quite as bad as it was uh, in 2017, but I'm still inclined to think that uh, mass abstention in the legislatives may well favour uh, Macronist rather than those to his uh, right and left, but we shall see. Thank you. Thank you very much, Malcolm. That's very interesting. Right, so next, uh, Rainbow, if you would mind uh, taking, talking us through some of Mike's uh, contribution. Yes, um, right, that's the wrong slide, I need to start at the beginning. Uh, so, sorry to hear from me again, I'm doing a very poor imitation now of Mike Lewis Beck. Uh, I don't look much like him, I don't sound much like him, and I didn't write this paper, so I can't take any credit or blame for its content. Um, but I have worked with him on the past in election forecasting, so I'm going to do my best to convey the essence of uh, what he wrote. And he wrote the PowerPoint slides, so I'm going to try and get his presentation across. There are actually five authors, but for various reasons, uh, none of them is able to join us today. So he's come up with a new uh, electoral forecasting model. He's an expert on electoral forecasting. And um, this one is, trying to understand how voter expectations can help to predict the election outcome. And um, there are various ways to try and forecast elections, um, looking at markets, looking at models, looking at polls, trying to understand people's sort of baseline preferences and, and so on. And uh, none of these models did particularly well in 2015 or 2017. 
So um, he's arguing whether it's possible to come up with an alternative to opinion polls to, to try and offer a good long range forecast. And um, their proposed solution is voter expectation polls. And uh, there are two different ways of measuring voter intentions. Um, so the, the pocketbook forecasting uh, model um, asks people if there were a general election tomorrow, who would you vote for? And that tells you what each individual prefers and how they would vote. But what he's instead suggesting we look at is, irrespective of how you yourself will vote, who do you think will win the next general election? Which then reflects the individual knowledge about the community's preferences. And so this is what uh, the authors of this paper are referring to when they talk about citizen forecasting. They're talking about people's general expectations about the election outcome, irrespective of their own personal preference. Reference. And so they're trying to uh, manipulate the wisdom of crowds and try to use this to understand the election outcome. And why do they think this would be a better model than trying to gauge the collective response uh, to people's individual preferences? Um, and their argument is that when individuals poll information collectively, they make better decisions than individuals acting alone. Um, they give an example of where individuals were asked to guess the weight of an ox and the mean guess was more accurate than any individual guess. Um, and this leads to Condorcet's uh, jury theorem um, that if each member independently chooses the correct of two alternatives with the same uh, more than 50% probability, then as the group size increases infinitely, the probability that the group will choose the correct alternative using plurality rule approaches unity. So they're arguing that, you know, as, as the sample size increases, um, the group outcome is likely to surpass uh, the sum of individual outcomes. And um, they're also trying to understand what might shape individuals' um, expectations of the overall outcome. And of course, we're not operating in an information vacuum. We all have our own social network. So we talk to other people and learn about how they will vote. And that then gives us a sense of what people might do collectively. Um, and that shapes what, who we think will win. Um, so they say that forecasting accuracy depends on the representativeness of the social network. So I suppose if you're surrounded by people who are sympathetic to Le Pen, you might be more likely to think that Le Pen would win the election. Um, I think there are a couple of variables that they don't really operationalize in this paper. See, I'm not doing a very good job of pretending to be Mike because I'm critiquing his paper even as I'm presenting it. But I think there's also perhaps an element of wishful thinking that if you are strongly partisan towards one candidate, you might expect that candidate to do better than they actually will. And first and foremost, I think people are influenced by polling data that that, you know, that is what shapes the news discussion of the election and it's what shapes people's expectations of what's going to happen. Um, and we'll see later in the paper that often people's expectations of what's going to happen basically map onto the opinion polls. So the extent to which this adds value to opinion polls is, is questionable, but uh, this is the approach that they are taking. Um, and their prior research suggests that this approach works most of the time. Um, in France, it hasn't been applied very often. Um, when it was applied in 1995, it worked quite well. In 2012, it doesn't seem to have produced such, um, such reliable results. So they look at data for the 2017 and the 2022 elections. Um, for both of them, they're asking, um, how likely do you think it is that the presidential election will be won by uh, X candidates with a list of potential candidates? And um, for the 2017 one, they also look at that at the departmental level as well. I'm going to skip the methodology because I didn't write the paper. Um, in terms of their forecasts for the 2017 elections, they did OK. Um, they sort of got the general sense of who the top four candidates would be, but they thought um, on the basis of this model that Mélenchon would come second, whereas he actually came fourth, Le Pen was second, Fillon was third. It was a close race between second and fourth, but they got that a bit wrong. Um, so they, as you can see there, they um, overestimated um, Mélenchon and underestimated Le Pen and Fillon, whereas Macron they actually got fairly accurately. Um, 
I don't quite know how to interpret that graph, so I'm going to skip that. Um, and then they did uh, a sort of forecast in, in late 2021, um, where you can see that um, some of these results are quite inaccurate. Uh, Picress is massively overestimated here, 14.2%, where in the end she got under five. Uh, Melanchol is massively underestimated. Jado and Idogo are very much overestimated. Le Pen is underestimated. So not hugely accurate. Um, and what they don't say in these slides, but they do say in a blog post that they also shared with me, is that they then updated these questions in um, March and April 2022. And for March, the forecast was still reasonably off base. Uh, it was still um, overestimating. It, it got the order of the candidates a bit more correct, but it was still overestimating um, the people who did less well and underestimating the people who did the best. Uh, whereas their final forecast, um, which they ought to mention here because it was it was the one they did well in, um, ahead of the second round, they forecast 59% for Macron and 41% for Le Pen, which was actually more accurate than most of the polls. So they nailed it right at the very end. But um, as Lewis Beck will tell you, one of the um, key things that they're looking for as election forecasters is the ability to produce a long range forecast that's reasonably accurate. So they got that Macron was going to win, but the polls have also been saying for months that Macron was going to win and that Le Pen was going to qualify for the second round, but then lose in the second round. So there was a question about the extent to which this was any more meaningful really than the polls. And I think that would be the question that I would put to Lewis Beck if he were here to defend this paper in the Q&A, but as he's not, um, I, I don't feel qualified to answer questions on this paper, but at least you've had an opportunity to hear the, the highlights of what they're on about. Thank you very much, Rainbow, for stepping in and volunteering to do that. So I think during the discussion later, uh, we will you know, have to stay away from raising questions on the paper. We can comment on it, uh, but uh, Mike is not here to answer them. So uh, I wouldn't want to pretend to uh, know uh, much about it. It's an interesting, um, an interesting model of forecasting, I think. All right, so next we, are, so Helen is next and Helen is going to talk to us about Franco-British relations. Thank you. Yeah, so we're sort of changing perspective, aren't we? The sort of the second half of the um, the panel is the transnational implications of the outcome, and I think um, John as well after me. So we're both looking at looking sort of from the outside, the inside out, I guess. Um, so thanks, Rainbow and Emily, for organising today and for inviting me. And apologies to all for not providing a more detailed title, you know, partly inefficiency overlooking. And also I had some contenders. So I'm gonna start with the sort of the contenders, which is a way to, for me to, I'm afraid I'm gonna to have to first look back at the Brexit backdrop uh, to the relationship. And then I will look ahead to the next Macron term. So um, yes, I mean, one contender for the title was quote, we thought we were friends. Um, and that expression of dismay was uh, pronounced by a British, diplomat a British diplomatic official. And it comes from the title of a research project that I carried out with Pauline Schnapper, my French colleague, um, on Franco-British bilateral diplomacy during the Brexit negotiations. And we identified Brexit as a genuine shock to, as you said, Francois, a relationship that's always been up and down. And maybe I'll come back to that. But Brexit is a genuine shock to the what we call the FBBR, the Franco-British bilateral relationship. And it did lead to unexpected tensions, uh, particularly at the start of the negotiations, which the, the Brexit negotiations, which saw um, the bilateral play second fiddle to the UK EU talks. So this British diplomat was interviewed quite early on, you know, oh, but we thought we were friends, sort of in reaction to initial French reactions, I guess. To, um, to the Brexit vote and, and what came afterwards. And indeed, I think a second contender for the title could be taking sides because during those Brexit negotiations, kind of whichever phase we take, um, 
France found itself slash was forced into slash enthusiastically joined, so take your pick, the side of the EU27, which the EU27 kind of faced off, faced down the UK, as I said, all stages of the negotiations. And France, therefore, was very much on the side of the EU. Now, others, including, say, Calypso Nicolaidis, has pointed out to me quite forcefully that, um, that there was no question, but that France would take the EU27 side, if you like. So sort of suggesting that it's, it's not an ideal metaphor to take sides. And it's true that both under Hollande and then Macron, who spanned the sort of post-Brexit period, France rigorously defended, didn't it, EU unity. But I suppose myself and Pauline sort of argued that it wasn't without discomfort for the Franco-British bilateral relationship. Um, and let me just give you some examples, if I may, of that discomfort, because it's not irrelevant. You know, I mean, I think it was Emily, you said, you know, are we post pandemic or in the pandemic, whatever it's like, well, are we, <laughs> are we in Brexit, post Brexit, et cetera. It's, it's an, you know, it, it, it is still relevant. So, so some of the discomfort that is ongoing is, and I'm just picking some examples around questions relating to borders, mobility and migration. So let me take two picks here, really. Um, looking at the discomfort of having to pick sides, even if you think of it just as operational discomfort. So obviously the end of the freedom of movement and its implications for UK citizens in France and vice versa. Because um, despite the centuries old chasse croisé of French and British citizens across the channel and beyond the arrangements made in the withdrawal agreement, there's not really any provision and there's no possibility because of having to take sides. There's no provision for any special Franco-British deals on this channel crossing, if you like, on the, uh, the, the traffic of people um, with the right to cross the channel. And, you know, in the absence of an EU-UK deal, which is really unlikely, and it's certainly not on the agenda at the moment, France and the UK sort of have to subject each other's citizens to the vagaries of their own immigration policies. Um, so you might say, well, so, so what, you know, how does that matter? Well, I've already alluded to kind of the historical chasse quasi, the historical traditions or, or habit, um, habits of crossing the channel. But it's, you know, so there's a historical rupture, you could say, but also um, strong bilateral relationships have their foundations, not only in treaties and, tr and texts and government pronouncements, but in the fabric of ties between two population, between the populations. And you know, the UK's so-called soft power post-Brexit is in theory relies precisely on such ties um, and what they represent. And also, I mean, you know, far, um, far be it from me to rant or anything, but people's lives are involved here and their livelihoods. Um, so I'm talking here about the, 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 the curtailing of the freedom of movement. Um, and then a second sort of discomfort, if I could put it like that, arising from this takes us to what I'm calling, you know, the ongoing shame of the situation of the undocumented or otherwise irregular migrants seeking to make the perilous crossing across the channel in the so-called small boats and with the tragedies that have become sadly familiar. So although you're probably all aware there are bilateral Franco-British arrangements and deals to address the situation, basically the UK sends over a load of money uh, to try and equip the French and motivate French authorities to patrol and police the shores. Um, but, you know, far from taking back control, the, the UK's exit from the EU framework, in particular the Dublin Three framework for so-called returns and, re and um, removals of minors and so on, you know, the UK leaving the, UK, the EU has created a governance gap and it's exacerbated diplomatic tensions between the UK and France. So those are just two examples, if you like, of uh, the fallout. And I've spent time on the fallout from Brexit because, as I've just sort of hopefully demonstrated, Brexit has restructured the Franco-British relationship um, you know, because France and the EU are no longer member states. Um, and it's restructured it, I argue, in ways that most likely override political change. So enter Macron too, if you like, sort of getting to the part where I look ahead. So to put it another way, I'm not really expecting things to change very much in the relationship in the foreseeable future. Um, so let's have a look at you know, some of the reasons. So it's not all about Brexit, is it? Um, and there's life beyond. So let's look at some of the relevant factors, 
shaping the FBBR from the French perspective, which I don't think, and I don't think the relationship would change much. I mean, we could start with leadership and personalities. There was an interesting discussion earlier, wasn't there, about charismatic personalities. I mean, I'd rather, I'm not gonna to say too much here, other than, you know, there's a lot of sort of rife, a lot of, a lot of what's the word, sort of, um, yeah, so Macron, did he or didn't he call Johnson a clown? Um, you know, Macron uh, or, or Johnson, does he think X, Y, Z of Macron? But the, I think the fact, obviously, leaders and personalities do matter. And it, most commentators will say that while Johnson is in post, I haven't looked at the news today, so I'm assuming he's still in post. Is he still in post? Yes. Um, this, the relationship at that level is unlikely to evolve. So, yeah. Um, what about policies? Well, I think, you know, where do the two stand on policies? Some of the Brexit fallout is being resolved, for, for example, over French fishing rights, which came to prominence, even though it's a relatively minor, if I could say, sort of economic sector. Um, but I've just said that migration and immigration are more thorny. Um, in terms of policy, again, I mean, the two countries do share priorities around climate change, cost of living and so on. Um, and on foreign and defence policy, the Franco-British relationship, of course, has its bilateral provisions for cooperation. So the Lancaster House treaties, for example. But in practice, all of that, uh, sort of the tributaries of broader um, strategic considerations, where, the, where France and the UK really still have to work out their differences and where the context is just evolving so rapidly. So for example, over the role of NATO, um, in the defense of Europe has really come, so differences between France and the UK over the role of NATO in, Euro, in Europe's defense has changed yet again, vis-a-vis um, -vis the war in Ukraine. Um, and, and, but there are still differing regional ambitions and priorities, different histories of relations with Russia. So when it comes to the role that NATO plays, will play in European defense, obviously Macron's on, on record as, or mis, not misquoted, but is talking about NATO being brain dead. He'd, I mean, I could talk about that later, but it's um, there is a there is a, an objective kind of decision or an objective area here where the two countries, despite having mechanisms for cooperation and despite being quite mirror images in some way of each other in terms of their global standing, they have got differences over NATO that have been brought to the fore. Um, and so I'm still talking about strategically where the two countries do not necessarily see eye to eye. I mean, let me let me mention Macron's, uh, perhaps I unkindly put it, of his rehashing um, earlier this month of the long-standing French preference for a political Europe or a political commu uh, community. So in his speech on the 9th of May to the European Parliament, Macron overtly, explicitly name-checked François Mitterrand um, post um, German unif reunification and, and Mitterrand's call for a sort of confederation of, of European um, countries that would work flexibly to deal with their own defence and foreign policy and so on. And of course, in that, well, not of course, but in that speech, Macron did uh, implicitly mention the UK. He mentioned those that, he mentioned that this sort of flexible structure, as I say, which it's not, it's old news in a way. He, he, he implied that those who have left the EU, well, I think there's only one, <laughs> which is the UK effectively, could be part of this wider architecture. So that's, I think that's an interesting area, I think, for the future of Franco-British relations in a really fast moving environment. And um, I, maybe, maybe you're gonna ask me afterwards what I think. So we could come back to that where I think it's gonna go. Um, so, I mean, should I sort of, wrap up really, perhaps, that it's been argued, there's a very interesting piece by Tom McTague, uh, he wrote in The Atlantic in September last year. Um, and he sort of says, well, with regards to the with, to Brexit and its aftermath, so for example, Alcus, you know, the the, uh, the French losing the sub -con submarine contract um, to or the UK and the US and Australia kind of joining forces as it were. I mean, McTague argues that actually maybe French diplomacy failed over Brexit. You know, maybe France failed to anticipate how the UK would seek to pivot and embrace that pivot away from the EU. You know, maybe the relationship between France and Britain have got too cosy, too complacent. Maybe the two countries need to reset the relationship 
um, you know, maybe from the bottom up, which is not looking terribly good at the moment around uh, cultural exchanges and linguistic exchanges and so on. Um, I mean, the Franco-British Council and the embassies, they do maintain some of that bottom up activity around young leaders and so on. Um, just and you know, and we saw the UK appoint its first ever, not just its first ever female ambassador to Paris last year, but I noticed the first ever, well, one of the only non-Oxbridge ambassadors, Mena Rawlings. Um, I just note that with interest. And of course, we've now seen France's ambassador to the UK, Catherine Colonna, appointed as Macron's new Europe and foreign minister, although I understand she didn't have a terrific reputation for um, post-Brexit diplomacy. So, I mean, I'm ending sort of saying, well, there are sort of signs for, you know, it, the relationships um, uh, kind of jogging along. Um, there are big strategic priorities and, and, and potentially differences. But I think I'm going to finish by sort of saying, well, maybe, maybe none of this matters, right? There is a view that the Franco-British relation, Franco relationship doesn't kind of matter that much anymore uh, in strategic terms or in sort of global terms or even in terms of the interests of the French and the British. And I'm looking here at, um, it's Richard Davis has published recently on the Franco-British relationship. And he, I, I end by quoting him. He says, well, the world has moved on and French and British, sorry, British and French identities perhaps are now more open, he says, to far more important influences than that of the Franco-British relationship. So I'll end on that. I'll end on that point. Sorry if I've gone over time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helen. That's great. Thank you. I'm looking forward to the discussion afterwards. All right, so next we have uh, Professor jo John Ryan, who is going to tell us, uh, talk to us about global policy shifts and France's position as a leading ally in Europe. So a bit of a rejoinder to the previous discussion. So John, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for the um, invitation. Um, obviously, what I'm leaning to, to a certain extent here is, um, can um, France be the leading ally in Europe? And that will be dependent, really, what happens with, with Germany. But I will cover some of the other areas that this uh, global policy shift uh, scenario uh, uh, touches on. Uh, now more than ever, the EU needs to engage France to be able to bring ideas to the table and demonstrate leadership, even if it's not always appreciated by other member states. And following on uh, from Helen's um, discussion, French-UK uh, relations post-Brexit are, to say the least, strained. And despite the UK's intelligence and military strengths, its political direction has been compromised by what is the failure of Brexit. And a prime minister and a conservative party mired in corruption and incompetence. Macron is unlikely to rekindle the relationship before Boris Johnson is replaced. Um, this means to a certain extent that, you know, there are uh, options there for Macron, which we can see very clearly. Um, he will focus on transatlantic relations. The Ukraine crisis has shown the US and the EU need to strengthen their partnership. And Macron is seen by the US as their most important foreign uh, and defense ally in Europe at the moment, uh, especially the Biden administration. Uh, and Merkel uh, was uh, a strong um, uh, um, person for, for um, uh, previous presidents, um, even if they were, were talking down to it, they felt that. Uh, uh, Germany was important. Um, that that has changed somewhat, and obviously the UK been out of the game. Uh, uh, and with the leader that the UK has at the moment, the United States is looking towards uh, Macron and France. So Germany, um, so France has to deal with the issue of how it's going to uh, deal with the Germany, which has been the first among equals and. This has uh, become more clear, and we've talked about um, Mitran, and obviously we look at coal and the law, and we look at at that time, and um, German unification was a, a game changer at that time. The introduction of the euro uh, was something that the French were very clearly looking for, so that the Deutschmark wasn't the reserve currency within 
uh, uh, Europe. Uh, this caused some problems with the German economy at the time. Uh, it had to uh, deal with a 1.95 D mark to Euro um, uh, exchange rate, which uh, hit their industry, but they were able to get, become pretty competitive pretty quickly. The enlargement of the EU to the east as well was uh, making Germany uh, obviously the, the leader within Europe. And the Eurozone crisis obviously put um, uh, uh, Germany front and centre. But things have changed, uh, Marco. It's gone. We could go over that era with the criticisms and pluses about what she did. Uh, but the war in Ukraine has brought some of the problems that uh, were there under Merkel and other leaders. So is Germany losing its EU leadership role to France? Um, uh, Germany has developed a credibility problem since the invasion of Ukraine because of its history as a partner with Russia. Uh, and this could have an impact on the balance of power in the EU. Obviously, we know that Zelensky in April invited Merkel to Kiev, uh, to the suburb of Bucha, where civilians had been massacred allegedly at the hands of Russian troops. See for herself, in his quotations, the policy of concessions to Russia, and he was pointedly picking out, obviously, Germany. The former German foreign minister and current German president, Frank Walter Steinmeier, admitted to misjudgment that it cost Germany a lot of credibility. And obviously, the former Chancellor Gerhard Schroeder has a very strong, although he's tried to distance himself somewhat from Putin, he hasn't been that successful. So when the war broke out, Olaf Scholz proclaimed the Zweiten Ende, a historical turning point, a paradigm shift, to underscore the German government was willing to take action uh, to support the Ukraine. But Schultz also warned of a third world war and hesitated to commit arms deliveries and extensive energy boycott against Russia, though we are seeing in the news that uh, this might change over the next few days. He also announced a dramatic increase in the defence budget, 100 billion euros. That sounds a lot of money, but where the German armed, German armed forces are at the moment, and we can go into this in greater detail later, with its public procure, procurement policy and the um, and the aging uh, tanks and aircraft and, and military equipment, um, um, this impact of this 100 billion will be eaten up fairly rapidly. Also, as a sidebar to that, um, the, the, the government itself and the governments previously haven't really dealt with the right wing extremism in, within uh, the German armed forces. So um, we could get granular on some of the uh, political parties, and maybe I would leave that till um, the um, uh, Q&As about the election results and the, uh, the last three uh, regional elections and what impact that's had on policy within Germany. So President Macron and Chancellor Schulz have an opportunity to position the EU as a serious partner in economic and foreign policy terms, and to a lesser extent, defence and security for the, for the US. One permanent feature of the EU is that France and Germany need to work together for that to happen. Uh, another way is there's always tensions between Paris and Berlin. The job of, uh, as uh, a diplomat has mentioned, a job of the French is to come up with the ideas and the job of the Germans is to block those ideas or shape them. So at the moment, even though uh, uh, the relationship on the surface seems to be uh, reasonably strong between Schultz and Macron, there's a certain lack of warmth uh, uh, that was there between Merkel and Macron. Nevertheless, um, it should be easier for Macron to achieve what he wants on European defence. But that doesn't mean Germany will always buy European and especially French uh, equipment as Macron might hope. Schultz has announced plans to buy American F-35 fighter aircraft to maintain Germany's military commitment as part of NATO. Germany goes ahead and buys more F-35s. That would call into question a project for a new Franco-German Spanish fighter. During uh, Macron's second term, France is, a, is about to become the most influential member state that can be in the EU at the moment. The EU, as we know, is organised in a way that even the very influential member state cannot, cannot always get its way. 
As Macron has learned over the past five years, member states need to build alliances and work with European institutions to achieve their objectives. This is why the EU is usually moved slow, but with sudden shocks such as COVID-19 or the Russian invasion of Ukraine, can spur governments to change their policies quickly. So it's, too, um, it's far too early to judge the long-term impact of the war in the Ukraine. But if Macron gets his way, it will, be a, it will make a stronger EU role in defence, more technological and industrial sovereignty, and a bigger EU involvement in uh, fiscal policy. Some of the other European partners don't trust uh, France or Macron because he embarked on a strategic dialogue with Putin in 2019 without prior consultation to, with uh, Central and Eastern Europeans. In general, European policy on Russia cannot be left to Germany or France. The Central and Eastern Europeans, especially the Baltic countries, Poland, must have their say. Um, the French president's relations with allies outside the EU, EU has been spiky. In uh, 2021, France withdrew its ambassadors from the US and Australia very briefly after the secret signature of the ECOS uh, Security Pact which involved a loss of major French arms deal. And in London, uh, Macron is perceived the EU leader most hostile to Britain. On the back of the war in Ukraine, many EU countries are now keener than ever to keep Britain and the US in the room when European security is discussed. This makes them wary of France's talk about strategic autonomy. The renewed importance of NATO is signalled by the new interest of Finland and Sweden in joining the alliance. As it seems at the moment, uh, and I'm sort of uh, coming to the end here of, um, of my, my talk, is, uh, you know, Macron once wrote a book called Revolution, but since being re-elected as, as president again, um, he's, Someone has mentioned that he's ruling like a risk-averse investor. He's been very, very careful. And so he has the foreign problems and he has domestic problems to make um, his um, a view about Europe and France's role within it become a reality. The strategic autonomy might not be, might not be something that uh, Germany and others should kind of reject because um, of what's happened in Ukraine and Russia. But also, even though this is two years, two and a half years out, the possibility of Donald Trump becoming the United States president again uh, would uh, create a lot of problems for, for the EU, France, Germany, et cetera. So this is something that everyone needs to carefully think about and act accordingly. Domestic problems, as has been outlined earlier this session, uh, is really around the fact that when you start looking at these um, polling data and what people want, that every three days you can see a change, a shift in terms of percentages towards Malichon coalition, the left coalition, even though that's not reflected at the moment in getting enough seats, it's going to, that trend keeps as it is at the moment, that could create a lot of problems. Uh, for um, uh, Macron. And the question is, is the ground game good enough at, at, um, at, uh, at, at, at uh, electoral district level for, the, um, for, for, for uh, Macron's coalition? Because as, as it's been pointed out, Macron's own party is not really a proper party. I think in the last session, we're gonna have a very good exposition of, um, of that party and how it's formulated. Um, so there is that. And then there's other issues, obviously pensions and the elitist um, composition of the cabinet at the moment. And these issues uh, that are revolving around potential rape allegations that, that they have not seemed to be taken as seriously as they should have been. And um, green policies, uh, the, the government might have uh, some difficulties as well, um, um, because some of the people that have been appointed to deal with this have a lot of um, uh, um, industry links. They're technocratic and in they have industry links with um, 
um, some energy firms, etc. So he's got a lot on his plate, and um, I think his foreign and domestic problems might be something that will follow him through his term of office as president. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. Uh, many different dimensions to, uh, to that paper. Okay, so um, perhaps I could ask the panelists to um, respond to each other, react to each other's comments, uh, and share their thoughts on, on their various different themes before uh, tackling the specific questions. Um, so, who, uh, Malcolm, would you like to, to start? Unmute yourself first. Yeah, I mean, if, if I could uh, speak uh, in particular to uh, Helen's uh, comments about uh, Franco-British uh, uh, relations. And uh, I mean, the, the thing I was thinking about, she did, uh, did end up uh, uh, saying something about it very, very helpfully. But uh, I mean, how much do you think they were, uh, they were poisoned by the, uh, the Ancus affair? Uh, and is that still rankling in, uh, in, in France uh, or in governing circles uh, with Macron at the, uh, at the moment? So a rather specific question uh, from from me uh, Helen yes um, well we can come back to the question should we come back to those shall I yeah maybe I'll come back to the question um, if there are any more I mean I, I had a question for you Malcolm actually but it wasn't direct so forgive me it wasn't directly on on what you were I mean it, it um, the question came into my mind listening to you talking about the 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 um, the spoiled ballot ballot papers and so on, and it's a question I've had on my mind. It's about postal voting. So, is that I should maybe maybe I should know this, so I don't mind exposing my ignorance. But is you know in France has it been a deliberate decision not to allow postal voting? Is there any discussion or debate about it? Yeah. And and do you have any views? Yeah, well that that that, that it is a. Uh an interesting one if I can comment straight away on, on that that uh, the French did have uh, postal voting between uh, 1946 and uh, 1975 when uh, when they abolished it that was within France its, uh, itself I mean it was fairly restricted to, uh, to certain uh, categories uh, and it was abolished in, in 75 with, without really too much uh, debate or, uh, or controversy and uh, I mean, my impression is that uh, the French very much value voting as a public act. And uh, there was this underlying feeling that uh, as far as possible, you, you should, you should uh, encourage people to, uh, to vote uh, publicly rather than, uh, than to, uh, to vote uh, by, by post. Uh, but of course, there was also the issue as there is uh, in, in other countries of the security of uh, the, uh, the the postal ballot and uh, whether the uh, the named person has actually personally cast that vote or, or whether it's uh, it's being done by by someone else so there, there was that practical uh, issue as well but having said that and finally of course uh, in uh, in what was said uh, earlier uh, what Sue Collard was saying there there is postal voting in terms of the uh, the overseas voters the uh, ex uh, expatriate, so it does. Uh, it has been revived in more more recent years, in the past twenty years, as uh, as a result of uh, bringing them into uh, contention. So, do you want to unmute yourself and ask the questions in a minute? <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Um, I've never quite understood why they've allowed it for the legislative elections, but not the presidential for overseas voters. Yeah, it seems that it would be, if I may just butt in, um, it would be a simpler thing for the presidential election somehow. Administratively, I would imagine there would be less risk of, I don't know, error or... Given that, as you say, you know, I mean, people don't li necessarily live near to Bristol or London or, you know, the places where you have to go and vote. I mean, I suppose you have to do your, you could, you've got the option of a population, but... I haven't understood the logic why they allow it um, mm. for one election and not the other. I haven't seen anything about that, but I did see quite a lot of stuff about worries about fraud when they allowed it for the legislative elections. 
Mm. Yes, I, I must uh, admit, Sue, I hadn't realised there was this d distinction there. Yeah. Was specifically for the uh, legislative yeah. uh, elections. So uh, thank you for drawing that to my attention. Oh. <laughs> right, uh, Helen and, and John, do you have uh, any uh, reactions to the other panelists' uh, discussions? No, I see John nodding, but uh, he's uh, muted, so you'll have to unmute yourself. <laughs> Oh, Sue has another. <laughs> well, if, if nobody has a, a question, I, I'd like to ask about um, the importance of the possession of nuclear weapons, because as we know, the UK and France both have them, but ours is very much under kind of American control, whereas the French is at least in theory independent. Um, and I didn't hear one single mention during the whole of the very long election campaign, I'm talking from the very beginning, you know, since September, I didn't hear in the discussion anywhere when there was lots of talk about defence once Ukraine came on and people were even talking about the possibility of nuclear war and perhaps a third world war and stuff. You'd think that at some point somebody's then going to raise the question of, well, if it got to that, you know, would France use its nuclear force to defend um, the rest of Europe? And I, I was on a panel on a uh, thing with China Radio or something a couple of weeks ago, and Christian Le Quen was, was on that panel, and I raised it there, and he said, oh, but La France has, you know, La Riposte Graduée, which is the old kind of de Gaulle thing about, you know, um, you know, the, the doctrine that officially goes with it. But surely that must have been, they must have moved on from that. So what's the position of, um, of that? I, I suppose that's a question for you, John, really. I'm intrigued to know um, a bit more about, you know, and plus the fact that, you know, France's seat in the UN, you know, should it give it up to the EU and that, those kinds of things. Yeah, I mean, we, we've been here before a very, very long time ago where um, battle, something called battlefield nuclear weapons mm. um, was something that retrospectively the Americans found out that the Russians had put battlefield nuclear weapons into, um, into uh, Cuba. So in, so in the Cuban Missile Crisis, so if things got really ropey there, they could have used those. So this all came out uh, later on. So I suppose I'm saying that because the Russians have been threatening um, that if things go badly enough, that they would possibly use battlefield nuclear weapons. I don't think that they would. I mean, it would be something else if they would think about uh, getting their silos fired up. You would see that with a satellite and everyone would be on high alert the British, the French, the Americans, and that would be it. I mean, <clears throat> Putin and the people around Putin have mentioned this, but we, what we heard yesterday, I think, we heard that uh, retrospectively, maybe two, three weeks ago, there was an assassination attempt on, on Putin, right? So um, I don't know how, uh, if, if that's fake news or if that's, uh, we're going to get more information about that, but people within Russia are getting very exercised about this kind of threat because whatever happens now, uh, Russia is going to suffer for the next 10 years economically and militarily, their, their conventional forces have not been up to scratch. And that was just obvious when you saw them in other few, uh, conflicts where they used very old tactics and use tanks all the time. And um, you saw from the Armenian and uh, Azerbaijan war in, about, about uh, uh, you know, new technologies. Now, no one wants to talk about, the French don't want to talk about nuclear weapons because we had this discussion with um, uh, Persian Trident missiles and things like that, because I was living in Germany at the time and the French had their weaponry um, sort of aimed at what was a the folder gap, where is the, the, the scenario was that the uh, Russians would come through um, the east into into the west through a gap in in, 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 Germ in Germany, and uh, that's where you would have to stop them, and you wouldn't be able to stop them with domestic um, 
domestic forces. So you would probably have to resort to battlefield nuclear weapons. And the, the Germans had a joke, which was uh, uh, the shorter the weapon, the deader the German, right? So I think this is something they don't want to bring up in conversation because it makes a lot of people in, in Europe um, very, very nervous. So no one has really talked about that very much on the whole of the Western alliance. What they kept reiterating, which is something that um, why they're worried about someone like Trump coming back, is if one um, a member of NATO is attacked, then the other members of NATO would come to the aid of that member. But they're not going to openly start making threats that they can't back up or don't want to make those threats because it makes people very, very ner nervous about that situation. So, it's, I mean, there was discussion about nuclear, but it wasn't really about weapons. It was about, obviously, energy sources more than anything else. And, um, yeah, I mean, that, that, that was uh, something else. But, uh, no, uh, it's, it's, it's a strange one, but uh, there you are, have it. It makes the Germans very nervous uh, if France starts talking about those things, I think. Thank you, John. Um, any other uh, LOD? Yes, uh, perhaps. Yeah. I think you. Yes. I mean, I must say, as a French person, when I moved to the UK, I was like, "Oh, you can talk about nuclear weaponry suddenly," because in France, it's never part of campaign discourse, debates. It's kind of outside of the realm of any form of apparent democratic scrutiny. Um, but my. Point I wanted to make is to sorry to, to go back a little bit to the, the talk discussions about voting and uh, postal ballots, and I'm thinking maybe one of the reasons why we don't really have postal ballots is if you look at postal ballots as we have them, and I say we, I mean French people in the abroad in parliamentary elections, uh, we have to vote earlier than everyone else. Uh, the first round of parliamentary elections for uh, French people living abroad. I hate the word expat, so I'm not going to use it. Uh, as, uh, as what in 10 days time, yeah. a week before everyone else. And I think that's largely because of the postal ballot. But if you place yourself in a contact, so if you think, so maybe the thinking would be you have to do that as well for everyone else if you generalize postal ballot. Place yourself in the context of a um, presidential election where in the last week or so, you have the, that's when the debate really intensifies. That's when you have the candidates debate, etc. And then people will vote in before all of this has happened. Uh, and I'm speaking as well from experience because that's literally what happened to me in the Northern Ireland election that took place very recently, where I was abroad, had to vote in advance. But indeed, most of the campaign was in the week before, so I had already voted by the time the leaders' debates happened, etc. I think there might be a, a timing issue in, in relation to, to these elections for the, um, the lack of postal ballot. This being said, we also have uh, online voting again. Uh, as a, <laughs> I don't know how that's going to work. Uh, that they, after they didn't have it in 2012, they were too afraid of uh, really Russian hackers. Uh, five years ago. So after the experience of 10 years ago, this is going to happen uh, again uh, this year. There's, we're pretty much bombarded with emails about it, actually, from the, uh, uh, from the, from the ministry about this. We, I guess they're hoping it will boost up turnout a bit because it's, I mean, you've seen how terrible it was in presidential elections. It's going to be even worse in parliamentary elections. I think some people might actually get to forget that you can vote in a polling station as well because they're pushing so much the online one that um, I don't know if people remember they can also vote uh, in person. Yes, Sue uh, mentioned this. Maybe you, you came in a little bit late, later. Uh, we had a little chat about this this morning about this uh, uh, voting online for expats. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, if I could just come come back on the, the postal voting, uh, I did a bit of research on how it actually uh, operated or the, the results, the effects when it was uh, being used uh, after, uh, the, after the Second World War. And uh, in fact, it was relatively uh, little uh, used. 
uh, you know, the, the number of people availing themselves of the opportunity who were able to do so uh, was, was, uh, was relatively uh, low. So I don't think there was any great uh, clamour to uh, to preserve it when it was proposed uh, curtailing it. I mean, to some extent, there, 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 there was uh, a greater uh, availability of proxy voting when it was uh, when it was abolished to uh, to compensate, and that has increased uh, somewhat in uh, in recent years. But, I think people's mobility hmm. impacts that as well. People are much more mobile now, sure. might find it more difficult to have a proxy in their constituency, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And this is where postal ballot would be a useful replacement. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe more so than in the 40s and 50s. There's also the fact that now you have to choose between whether you vote in your home commune or whether you vote as a, an overseas voter. So before you could you could choose and the new law means you ha you have to decide whether you where you want to um, where you want to vote. So if you vote if you decide to stick with your commune d'attachement, you can vote in all the elections, but you can't vote in the consulaire, and that's the only one you can't vote in. But then, unless you want to go back to France, you've got to do a procuration. I'm not sure to what extent the longer you live abroad. Uh, to what extent you can actually stay uh, listed as a voter in your original commune. I know I've, I was. I've had a look. It's pretty easy. I mean, there's all kinds of things, having property, having family, having, yeah, yeah mm. it's quite easy to demonstrate that you've still mm. got a kind of link there. They're quite, mm. to be quite mm. open on that. Yeah. But the, the, the issue of mobility is also, also applies to people living in France. People are a lot more mobile and move about a lot more uh, than, they, than they used to back in the 50s or 60s. Oh. And again, I think that you know, a, a, a further comment is to say that you know the, the, the French are very concerned about uh, the uh, declining turnout, but it's interesting that uh, I, I don't think I've come across any proposals for uh, reviving postal voting as a means of uh, of uh, combating that. What 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 of course has come back into play is is compulsory voting, which uh, has uh, has. Uh, had a, a quite a history in the uh, history of, uh, of French elections. Uh, so. Right. Okay. Um, so, uh, if there are no more reactions uh, from the panelists to each other's, um, I'm just looking at the chat box. I seem to be the only one submitting questions directly, or am I missing something? But I, I did earlier ask Helen if there was. Uh, uh, to what extent France's uh, ho holding of the rotating presidency of the EU Council, which ends uh, at the end of June, I guess, yeah. to what extent that affected, if, if at all, um, the Franco-British relationship? And then to Malcolm, whether uh, the study of abstention and spoil ballots and blank ballots is kind of a French phenomenon. You never read about that elsewhere for other elections. And then to John, um, I, I submitted a question also, I think, uh, asking about what your thoughts are uh, about Macron's attitude to keep channels open, uh, channels of communications open to Putin, uh, in spite of strong opposition from some of the EU, no, uh, Central European countries like uh, Poland in particular, who are quite uh, Quite worried about this. So, uh, to what extent uh, is that actually true uh, that he, he still is claiming that you know, uh, uh, Russia, you know, the, the face saving um, aspect of, uh, of uh, staying um, open to, to discussions with, with Putin? Well, well, shall I just, yeah, I, I, just, think, I just think that that's. Um, um, we don't know the full story, what's going on there, whether that is an individual thing that he's he's doing for himself or whether as a, a European leader that the Americans trust, that they have a discussion, they have someone having a direct discussion with um, Putin about various issues to see what his thinking is, because otherwise their intelligence services and British and American intelligence have been very good at battlefield um, 
uh, assessments of the Russian army and losses and things like that. But we don't totally know what's going on in the Kremlin and what's on Putin's mind. So somewhere along the line, maybe further down the line, we will find that either the Americans were um, supporting this effort. It did ruffle feathers because the way he does things ruffles feathers everywhere, right? He comes up with good ideas. He comes up with actually, uh, you know, doing stuff. And that sort of uh, tips over the apple cart in a sense. And of course, we have to remember during the campaign what he said about the leader of Poland, who said um, um, uh, that uh, there, there goes a anti-Semite and et cetera, et cetera. And, um, so his relationship with Poland isn't that great, but the problem with that is Poland's taking on the refugee unbelievable effort, even if they're getting money and everything else, it's unbelievable effort that they're doing there from a humanitarian perspective. Also, Poland has a, an operational army and military force, unlike Germany, so it's one of the countries that you would look at that could actually fight. So uh, the idea that the Russians would ever sort of inter, uh, go anywhere near the Polish border and and provoke the Poles to get involved would be a bit of a bad move by by the Russians, because that would be something that would not end well for them. I think along with the Ukrainian forces, and the Americans are backing the uh, the Poles up quite significantly. Just just so from that perspective, I think we, we're not really in the know, but it's a good exercise to find out what Putin is thinking. Just one one question I have, like generally, I'm a little bit to Helen, I suppose, if, if, because of what she said. I, I don't think that um, the Brexit, whatever happens after Johnson, things are going to get better. Because what we're dealing with in the United Kingdom and in England specifically, is an English populist nationalist kind of um, animal in terms of the Conservative Party. Britain for, uh, first have infiltrated the Conservative Party. That's a right wing, hard right wing organisation. UKIP and Brexit supporters infiltrated the party. Um, and when you look at any potential candidates that might be uh, acceptable in uh, uh, as former Conservatives, they have no chance of winning the leadership of the election. And in this discussion, Northern Ireland Protocol is becoming the campaigning tool for some of these other people behind the, uh, behind uh, Johnson. When Johnson goes, and he will go at some stage, I'm not going to be one of those who says he's going now, but because we've people have said that so often. And he's not going to go until he's pushed. And that means the Conservative Party has to get rid of him. So that means that um, we've got a situation in the UK that Scotland is possibly next five years going to have a referendum where they leave the United Kingdom. There will be a border poll in the, Repub uh, in, in, in the Republic and in Northern Ireland. Maybe there's a United Ireland. And Wales, I'm not so sure about, but I was I'm laughing a little bit about 10 days ago when someone from the Telegraph said, um, look, this is getting all too much, the United Kingdom. Why doesn't England actually see from the United Kingdom, which I thought was quite funny, it would solve everybody's problem in terms of Scotland, Ireland and Wales. So um, I don't see the relationship between the United Kingdom and France getting better anytime soon because of the people who will follow after, after Johnson. And it's not only the uh, it, it, you know freedom of movement it's what it's doing to the education sector in the united kingdom and research in the united kingdom it is it's, it's incredible and the damage it's going to do to the city of london london drip 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 so um that's just something i thought i'd throw in there that it's not going to go go away anytime soon this uh, difficult relationship yeah I mean, I agree, I agree with that. And I, I did sort of mention there were other other dimensions that I just picked, you know, I just picked a couple, but that's where I really wanted to end about talking about the fabric of the relationship um, that does depend on cultural exchanges and so on. And the, the uh, diplomats that we spoke to in France, so we were doing the interviews in 2020, 21, you know, they were, they talked about that they were doing a, a sort of a deep review of the Franco-British relationship and that, and that you had to have people who cared and you had to have academic exchanges and so on. But as you said, the way that 
Brexit has actually evolved and taken shape is not is not terribly encouraging. I mean, to Francoise's question about the um, the uh, French presidency of the EU, and I know John, you've answered some of that. I think that you know you asked to what extent it affected the Franco-British relationship. I mean, in some ways, it relegated its significance even further, um, and it did expose Macron. I think sort of John kind of pointed to that. In particular, I was going to say the dialogue with Putin. It, it very much exposed. Um, Macron in that respect, but I think it also potentially exacerbated the difference, or the, whether it's real or constructed, between France and the UK. Um, it allowed sort of Johnson and so on to appear more responsive to Ukraine, and in some respects, as they were, it sort of allowed the UK to almost play to this post-Brexit. We're nimble, you know, we're not, we don't have our hands tied, and so ever whatsoever. Whereas obviously, by chairing the council, Macron sort of by definition had tied hands, you know, it, 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 it pointed up um, the extent of the French commitment following Macron's re-election. So I think that's the case. And then I think, Malcolm, you asked about AUKUS and whether it still rankles. Yeah, I don't know, actually. I mean, I suppose, um, you know, it's still, it's still quite early days because that was quite late in September, really, wasn't it? And then we've had the election since. I suppose, I, you know, the thought that came in is that you talked about governing circles. Well, Macron is very much the, the kingpin, isn't he? Uh, both in terms of constitutional power, but also in terms of his predilection for international affairs and his sort of strategic discourse, his strategic moves, are, they are a moving target as, you know, in keeping with, with events. So he, he doesn't really talk so much, for example, about strategic autonomy, you know, he's replaced that with sovereignty. And I, I, I mean, Sue, I know that you watched the debate like forensically and maybe others did too, but I did think that in that debate between Macron and Le Pen, he used that word European sovereignty and Le Pen came back with immediately, you know, no, only un peuple could be souverain. He just like royally ignored it, which obviously was the right thing to do. But I thought that was quite an interesting point that she sort of hit on. Anyway, he doesn't so much talk about autonomy, but all these words are fluid anyway. You know, the St. Malo Declaration in 1998 had autonomy in it uh, and Tony Blair signed up to that. So, um, yeah, that would be my answer. I, I don't actually know. And it's a very good question. I think it does point up failings in French diplomacy that they didn't see it coming. Um, and it's just part of the kind of the moving parts that Macron is, is working with. Uh, who knows what he'll come up with next uh, would be my answer to that. Whether it rankles or not, I'm not so sure. I think that's covered the questions that I had. Uh, Elodie had her hand uh, earlier and then uh, Sue as well. Elodie. Thank you. Uh, um, Helen's discussion made me think of something, and that might just be an anecdote. Uh, I do wonder if that's more uh, widespread than that, as uh, maybe others have, have seen this. Uh, we've received emails, we received emails from all sorts of candidates uh, for the parliamentary elections. And, and a recent email from the um, candidate from Les Républicains, who's um, some guy who lives in the south of England, I think, um, had something about Brexit with, and, and the state of that relationship and I don't know if that's because he lives in the UK or if that's a broader view in, in Les Républicains but it was pretty much saying it's a bad relationship and it's because France can't get over Brexit and we need to move on from it and it's all the I mean they seem to be placing really the blame on Macron etc so I do wonder as well if that's because I looked him up a little bit and so him going to meet the Tories in Scotland, having a word with uh, another Tory in the south of England. So maybe that's where he's picking up some of these messaging as well with the Conservative Party trying to grow up to everything they can and influence people by also getting their own message out um, to, to counterbalance the, the narrative from the EU or, or, or on Brexit. So I don't know if that's more widespread or maybe some actual attempts here and there on the the Conservative Party tried to reshape some of that of that debate. I thought that was interesting in that perspective on something you don't hear a lot in the French context, I think, of it's actually the fault of the French. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, uh, it was just on Macron and Putin, uh, which seems to have been received worse outside France than in France. It doesn't seem that people in France have a particular problem with the fact that he's, you know, it's been seen as, as far as I can see, that, you know, at least he's maintaining a dialogue. We, you know, certainly in the early days, um, 
and, and I'm sort of getting a lot of this from BFN TV, which does kind of wall-to-wall -wall Ukraine coverage, but incredibly detailed stuff. And um, right early on, you remember there was all the stuff about uh, Chernobyl, um, and the French were very anxious that um, there were proper people um, uh, in there to check what was going on. And I think that there might be some involvement from French um, uh, companies um, running you, the, you know, some of the nuclear power stations in Russia. So I think there were, you know, they were trying to kind of check that Chernobyl wasn't going to blow up again or something. Uh, but also the second point is that, you know, since de Gaulle, every French president has had a strong relationship with Russia. I mean, it's just part of what France has done. Um, so in a way that the UK hasn't. So it, that strikes me as much more of a sort of um, unusual thing um, to be to be happening that Putin, you know, I, I'm obviously it's, it's kind of pretty much stopped now, hasn't it? The talks between um, Putin and um, uh, Macron uh, more recently, but that it was going on for some while doesn't particularly surprise me. John, do you... uh, on the um, Republican candidate, who's pro I'm not sure whether that person is uh, the um, the uh, person that uh, sits in the French Assembly for Northern Europe. No, it's another person, is it? Um, yeah, the, the, the current MP is Alexandre Holroyd, who's from, uh, from La République en Marche. Yeah. So, so you know, I, I just think that, you know, the, the, Republic, uh, uh, the, the Republicans have been sort of part of the EPP group. The EPP group has had this very strong tendency to try and work with the Conservative Party and the, the, the Republicans and the, C, the Christian Democrats in Germany, I've spent so much time from the time of Brexit actual vote to even recent times trying to understand the mindset of the Conservative Party and what's happening. And, and it's impossible. I, that I think they've given up now in the CDU and the CSU in doing that. But there still would be people who would think that, you know, if I can get in the mindset and think of those ideas and everything else, then maybe um, we, we can come to some solution. And obviously the other thing is that probably they're not particularly uh, strongly in favor of, um, of Macron. And if you look at the British media, generally 70% of the British media just attack whoever the leader of France is anyway, it doesn't matter which party, as a kind of a natural enemy somewhat. And Macron as, as someone who's bitten back at Boris Johnson on a regular basis, is a target for that, and it can have an influence, I suppose, on the, those people. But I think it's been a drastic decision by the EPP, and they're paying a price now in terms of how they're uh, what they're achieving in, in in elections all over all over Europe. They 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 are struggling, and uh, obviously the Republican Party went down to a very very low level compared to where it was 20, 30 years ago, even the last election cycle. So it's it's it, it's interesting that someone like that is saying such a thing. Thank you. Okay, so uh, welcome back to our third panel of today's conference. Um, a very exciting one where we're going to talk about what's going on in French political parties where there has been an enormous amount of upheaval. So there's a lot to say. And we are very fortunate to have expertise in this session covering pretty much the whole political spectrum. So we get the full range. Um, rather than doing a long list of introductions now, I'll introduce each speaker as we go, if that's OK. Um, and I'll take us in the order that we had in the programme. So we're going to kick off with uh, Philippe Manière, who is a professor in French and European politics at UCL. Um, he has wide ranging expertise on French politics with a particular interest in the French Socialist Party, and he may now perhaps resolve the debate that's been raging all day about whether it's uh, NUP or NUPES or some other pronunciation. So, Philippe, over to you. Thank you, Rembo. I I'm sorry, I can't answer your a very important question there, whether it's a NUPES, a NUP or NUPES. I've heard the three of them, so I, I shall say 
noop, maybe that's. But everyone should should feel free to use uh, to, to to call it uh, the way they want. Uh, yes, I'm going to to talk about noops. In fact, uh, this the, the launch of noops uh, right after the second round round of the presidential election uh, took a lot of people by surprise, myself included. I have to say, and of course, that also that changed the political mood in the run up to the uh, legislative election next month, and also probably changed a little bit also uh, the content of, of my paper. I, I, I gave you, Rainbow, uh, a more uh, downbeat uh, title about the prospects of the left. So, probably uh, if I could resubmit a title today, I would, I would sort of uh, title it Can Noops Revive the Fortunes of the French Left? Um, so what's NUPS? Uh, well, NUPS stands for Nouvelle Union Populaire Ecologique et Sociale. I won't try to translate it into English. You all understand, and it's pretty long to do. It's a coalition of parties on the left and gathering together the main left-wing parties, you know, Parti Socialiste, Parti Communiste, Europe Ecologie Les Verts, as well as smaller parties such as Génération, Génération Ecologie and Nouveau Démocrate. Uh, NPA, Nouveau Parti Anticapitaliste, the only anti-capitalist uh, party, uh, was also invited to join the coalition, but opted out on the grounds that it didn't want to take part in a coalition with, with the socialists. So NUPS is, an, in the first instance, each party signed a bilateral agreement with Jean-Luc Mélenchon's movement in Belle France. And last week, on the 19th of May, all the one-to-one -one agreements were included in a comprehensive uh, political manifesto, which contains 650 measures or policies. Uh, NUPS is therefore an electoral agreement, as well as a political program for a left-wing coalition government. If they win the election, they will, those parties will uh, govern together. Uh, the NUPS program is clearly of a radical reformist nature. It's very much in line with the radicalism of the program command, the common program of the 1970s, although one might argue that it doesn't call for a transitional break with capitalism, unlike the 1972 text, which in this respect was more radical. As uh, Thomas Piketty put it, uh, the United Left has put social and fiscal justice back on the political agenda. Uh, for instance, its flagship policies are putting back the retirement age to 60 and raising the minimum wage. A point of interest, I think, is that NUPS is quite open about policy disagreements within the coalition. Uh, there are policy differences on 33 measures between coalition partners. I'm going to just give a uh, a few, few examples. Uh, on Europe, first of all, there is a, a common endeavor to, and I quote, redirect the course of European integration towards more social justice, better environmental policies, and a commitment to defend public services. But each party's stand on Europe is flagged up. Uh, LFI is the heir of those who fought and rejected the 2005 constitutional treaty. I will not hesitate to disobey your EU law if the EU prevents NUPS from implementing its program. Uh, EELV, the Greens, support a federal Europe, and the Socialists are strongly committed to pursuing European integration. Another example of programmatic diplomacy is on the hottest topic of the war in Ukraine. Um, in the run-up to the presidential uh, vote, uh, PS, ELV, and Generation opposed LFIs and the, and the PCFs stand on the Russian aggression of Ukraine. They said that they were alarmed and shocked at Mélenchon's pro-Russian views until the start uh, to the war. But I think in the end, Ukraine will not be a casus belli for noops. Uh, the program uh, states that the coalition is, and I quote, committed to defending Ukraine's territorial integrity. It also points to Putin's crimes. This on the whole is fine, but also terribly vague uh, when it comes to explaining what would a NUPS-led government do to help Ukraine. They are absolutely 
uh, no provisions, no details about that. Uh, last example about uh, carefully drafted uh, uh, policies uh, which are part of this program and which try to really iron out differences, there's no mention of stronger disagreement with regard to NATO. Uh, LFI thinks that NATO constitutes a major threat in the region and wants France out of it, whereas PS is dedicated to NATO's membership. My, my second point is what led to the constitution of NUPS? I think there are several factors or events. Uh, going back to the, uh, the pre-presidential election, I think it was the rather unsuccessful popular primary election, which still uh, designated Christian Taubira as uh, uh, representing the left, allegedly. Of course, it was a fiction. I think her uh, candidacy was seen as bringing about further division to the left, and and, and she was uh, very soon abandoned by virtually everyone had to give up on a bid. I think in the end, it's opinion polls, which were the actual primary election on the left during the campaign. And after a slow start, Mélenchon, uh, as in 2017, finished very strongly and was defeated by Le Pen by Wiska. And I think what happened is, Again, as in 2017, many left-wing voters who probably uh, envisaged to vote for other left-wing candidates switch legions at the last minute and, tact and, 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 and tactically voted for Mélenchon in, uh, to prevent a rerun of the 2017 uh, contest between Macron and, and Le Pen. And I think this... Uh, is important to understand why we got noops right after the uh, second round and uh, Macron's re-election, because uh, then immediately Mélenchon offered, and I, I think that took a lot of people by surprise, offered his left-wing rivals to form a coalition. But he did it from a position of strength, having trounced all the other left-wing uh, candidates in the first round. And that's important because that meant that he could impose the tempo and the nature of the negotiation. What's more, he was, a, he was able, without any debate with his partner, to self-appoint himself as future prime minister, should, of course, Noops win the legislative elections uh, next June. I think Noops is indeed very much LFI's creature, uh, with uh, 325 candidates across France, uh, LFI has 56.3% of the total NUPS candidates. I should add that interestingly, NUPS represents a major tactical change for Mélenchon, who between 2016 and 2020 had scorned the left and embraced a so-called populist strategy. He unsuccessfully tried to federate the people beyond the traditional left and right a divide beyond also class divide. Uh, this didn't work out according to plan. And during Macron's first term, LFI's electoral results were poor. The movement failed to get a network of party officials elected across France. So in, in the end, Mélenchon badly needed NUPS to avoid being trounced again by Macron's party in the legislative election. Uh, currently, LFI has 17 MPs elected, and I think with the coalition, I think projections are showing that uh, the party and the left altogether could win up to 180, 190, and the more optimist even think that they could win the election altogether. So why did all the left-wing parties join the alliance? I think it's for the same reason as LFI. They also badly needed uh, that alliance to uh, salvage their parliamentary group. I think they the results of all other parties at, in the presidential election were so abysmal that they were running the risk without any such agreement to virtually lose all their seats in parliament. So in, in a sense, what started as a tactical retreat on the part of a weakened left has turned out to be a bit of a master stroke. Why? Uh, voters seem pleased with the coalition. It remains to be seen if absolutely everyone is pleased, but 
on the whole, I think the mood uh, seems quite a bit. And it gives everyone hope that the left might increase its representation in the National Assembly. For sure it will, if not win the election altogether. And also, I think the last point is about the Socialist Party, the PS. It might ironically boost the ailing fortunes of the PS, which I think over the past five years has been fighting for its survival. Why? Because the NUPS agreement gives PS a chance to shift to the left and reconnect with its electorate. If PS keeps left and manages to promote competent and progressive leaders, it might even recover lost ground and become a significant force on the left in the future. We're not there yet, but it's, it's a possibility. Why? Because uh, the coalition is currently dominated by LFI, its radical pole, which is a unique situation in the European left. M my last point very briefly is that there are now three electoral scenarios. First one is NUPS win an overall majority for the optimist. It's possible, although I think unlikely. Mélenchon will then become prime minister and NUPS will start to function as an umbrella parliamentary group. Umbrella, because each party would have its own uh, parliamentary group. The second scenario, case scenario is NUPS doesn't win an overall majority, but the left uh, significantly increase its number of MPs, which currently stands at 60. It's not much. So uh, they could really, that would be an incentive for the coalition to keep working together. And a third and, uh, scenario, uh, NUPS is largely defeated and maybe only LFI increases the, its total number of MPs. In that case, I, I think the resilience and strength of the alliance would be tested to the full. I think we can note that in scenarios two and three, it would mean the end of frontline political activities for Jean-Luc Mélenchon because he will not be running for re-election as an MMP. In a nutshell, my conclusion is to say NUPS gives hope to a weakened left by creating a new political dynamic, which challenges Macron's uh, full centrism, don't have time to elaborate on that, and is less fair economic uh, policies. Political differences between coalition partners can be ironed out, uh, at least in the foreseeable future, because if you look back at previous coalition governments on the left in 1936, 1981, and 1997, there were at the time a big political disagreement, but that didn't stop those parties to govern together for a while at least. And finally, one shouldn't lose sight of the fact that the total left-wing vote in France is currently around 30% plus. In comparison, right-wing votes, Macron's nebulous movement and allies together with the far-right total, 60% plus. So um, I, clearly there is no outright left-wing majority in France at present. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. That was really, really interesting. And thank you also for keeping to time. Um, so we're now going to shift a little bit along the political spectrum. And um, our next speaker is Elodie Fab, who's a lecturer in politics at Queen's University Belfast. She's interested in political parties in a comparative perspective and collects the data on France for the political parties database. And um, the second out of two presentations where the name of the party being discussed is not the same as when the abstract was submitted. So uh, LG was going to be talking to us about uh, La République en Marche. Uh, presumably she'll be talking to us now about Renaissance or even about um, the majority presidentielle. So uh, over to you, LG. Uh Thank you very much, Rainbow. Yes, I haven't got my head around Renaissance quite yet, eventually I will. Uh, it was already difficult to uh, get your head around how, again, it was pronounced or written, uh, La République en Marche, because sometimes you had L, R, E, M, or La, R, M. Uh, I went for La, R, M, because that's how they tended to call uh, themselves. Uh, so thank you very much. I've, I've been working a little bit on La République en Marche for, for a little while, looking at it through the prism of, of new parties. And uh, if we think about the success of, of new parties, the traditional literature would tell us, well, you know, new parties emerge because 
uh, there's a new set of interests uh, that, uh, uh, that need to be politically represented, or there's a, a new issue uh, that has come to the fore, and the old parties have failed to capture that issue, and therefore um, that creates that political space for a new party to, to emerge. So more recently, you can think about environmental issues or uh, immigration and identity. If we think about, uh, so at the time, En Marche or La République En Marche, uh, there's not a lot, we're not really talking about this new uh, electoral niche. Uh, La République En Marche is mostly a party that's kind of, it depends on who you ask. And if you look at sort of data from say Chapel Hill, or if you look at data asking people to place La République En Marche on, on a left right axis, they say, they're going to say it's a center right party on uh, the economy, uh, being in favor of uh, some uh, liberal, liberalizing uh, economic reforms, particularly about, about the labor market, uh, but at the same time also um, being in favor of uh, maybe a slightly reformed, but still a, a welfare state. Uh, and uh, on Galtan issues, at least at the time of the uh, election five years ago, it was slightly more on the sort of progressive uh, side of things, but it's not a massively different party in terms of party positions from, say, the modem uh, that existed uh, already. Uh, and so it's not exactly a brand new niche uh, that they're occupying. Likewise, it's very hard to identify a specific issue that would be owned by uh, La République En Marche against other political parties, like you would think the environment for Europe Ecologie et for instance. Uh, and so in that sense, the sort of traditional ideas of a party emerges because new interests have to be represented or there's a new issue don't really work when we come to uh, La République En Marche, I think. What I think has been quite interesting uh, is been looking at some of the literature on new parties emerging actually in Central Eastern Europe and uh, some of the discussion about parties uh, emerging as a, as a project of newness, uh, sort of uh, Alan Six uh, work on, on some of these parties. And these are parties that occupy a, a space on the political spectrum that is also occupied by other political parties. And what they really emphasize is doing politics differently and doing things better than other parties. And then if we look at 2017 and how uh, La République En Marche came about, it's had a lot of different labels and centrism, uh, progressivism, as that's also some of the, uh, their own uh, discourse about themselves. And there's been even work uh, by Perrottino and Gassi that was talk describing them as technocratic populists. And there is both elements uh, of anti-populism and populism, uh, or at least uh, in, in uh, La République en Marche. Anti-populism in the way that they presented themselves. Uh, a key element of the presentation of La République en Marche was we are the last bulwark against the national front. It's uh, us against them and the other ones, are uh, the other parties are obsolete. Um, they were pro-EU, but again, that's not against some of the populist parties being pro-EU was also a way to present themselves and, and fashion themselves as against populists, uh, and while at the same time also being pretty mainstream in terms of reformism and really appealing to ideas of competence. Uh, and some of the discourse was very much in, in terms of valence politics. We can all agree that some of these reforms, you know, regulated market economy uh, is, is a good thing. We can all agree that uh, the welfare state is uh, a good thing. Maybe there is some reform here and there, and there will be a safe pair of hands to, to achieve that. And then on the one hand, you had this anti-populism, but on the other hand, you also had some anti-establishment rhetoric, which obviously seemed kind of strange coming from uh, a, a former banker who was just plucked out into um, cabinets and, 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 um, and then a uh, ministry. But there was also a lot of discourse about how the old left-right cleavage was obsolete, how Macron and La, La République en Marche really managed to present themselves as sort of 
challenges against established parties. And this is the anti-establishment of against the established parties that I think makes it might get some people to call uh, the party populist. I think that's, that's an exaggeration, but this is the element that amongst other aspects may be similar to populist parties. The question of course for, for them is how, after 2017, how do you keep that momentum? How do you keep staying new? Being new can't be your uh, entire uh, program because it's not a really a, a long-term strategy. And then if you look at how parties can uh, keep going, then the question is about party institutionalization. And if we look at the institutionalization of La République En Marche, there are a number of elements about it. What it is like the party becoming sort of an end in itself rather, uh, rather than being a, a means uh, to an end. And we see there's been a lot of changes in the party. They had two party statutes, the first one uh, in 2017, a reform in 2019. Uh, they have had multiple names, En Marche, La République En Marche, now Renaissance. They're not running in parliamentary elections under either La République En Marche or Renaissance. It's ensemble with uh, other parties. Uh, Macron did not use any reference to the party in his own literature. Uh, I think that that can become a problem as well for you know, voters' identification with, uh, with the party itself. Uh, in terms of the parties still struggling to sometimes be more than the, just a vehicle for, for its leaders, uh, ambition and it's, if it's somewhat programmatic, as I was saying earlier, it's kind of hard to identify uh, a, a singular issue that the party could say that it owns. Um, and then, as I was also saying earlier, if you ask voters, they will place the party on the center or uh, the center or on the right. So there is a sense of identification um, with what the party, where the party is, roughly speaking, in on the left right spectrum or in terms of policies yeah. and even um, data from the, the European Social Survey asking for um, people what, who they felt closer to actually taking into account the fact that the largest group was people who did not identify with a single party that was half of the respondents then the next one up was La République En Marche with about 20 odd percent uh, of respondents saying they identified with La République En Marche ahead of all the other parties including those that had existed for significantly longer. So there is something there of not just thinking of in terms of, of Macron. In those years between 2017 and uh, 2022, the parties had some problems in terms of you know, developing local roots and becoming really embedded in, in society, which is obviously, as I think Francoise was saying earlier, it's, it's so unique to La République en Marche, French parties have traditionally with a so few exceptions, uh, was struggle to have really strong networks and membership, et cetera. So this is no new, not new, but I think the organization of La République en Marche hasn't helped with that, particularly the fact that their members are non fee members, that they don't really keep track of who's an active member, who's not an active member. Uh, they don't really have local office, um, physical offices at the local level. Uh, there's a very poor articulation between the different levels of organization that really make it difficult to get people organized and mobilized for elections, etc. And they've had, uh, as uh, I think Andrew was uh, showing earlier, really poor electoral results in local and regional elections uh, in between. And that also creates a problem because then they don't have a lot of people elected at the local level who might then go up the ladder uh, of, of electoral careers uh, for, for, for the party. And so if we look at 2022 and the election, we are in a situation with Macron kind of winning in spite of his party that has not really grown, grown at all during uh, those five years. And so the manifesto was again a sort of mix of uh, protective state and free market liberalism with an appeal of saying, so, you know, they're not new anymore. So what's the, what's the hook here? And it's, we had so much to do. And obviously there's been all these problems, including COVID. We have so much more to do left yet. And please elect us again so that we can keep doing the new stuff that we weren't able to do uh, last time around. And 
despite his late entry into the campaign, really that success is really built for Macron, whose popularity has been surprisingly stable over the last year or so, uh, considering all that's been uh, happening. And indeed, Macron was not mentioning the party at all. His posters had nothing to do with the, the party, he didn't have a party name or logo on it or anything. And a lot of that support and success ma managed to survive thanks to the sort of hollowing out of the Parti Socialiste and, and Les Républicains, who kind of struggled to build a, uh, an alternative here uh, in those five years and get, you know, sort of charismatic people to go back to a topic we discussed earlier, who would challenge sufficiently uh, Macron uh, on this and having problems with uh, identity issues, uh, but also frozen by the sort of COVID and then Ukraine crisis. And so then again, it managed to present itself as look at these old parties, they're so weak and divided, and it's again, it's us as the last war walk against the Rassemblement National. So again, presenting itself as this sort of anti populist uh, against the, um, the National Front, the Rassemblement National. And so uh, to conclude, the, um, the party is really still really strongly relying on Macron's image, who does not really emphasize any link uh, with, with the party uh, and has had relatively stable levels of uh, popularity and, and support. And there's a real brand problem for the party. Its party leaders are not particularly visible. Can't say that Stanislas Guerini is the most charismatic uh, of uh, party leaders. Uh, and the party is also quite poorly institutionalized. Uh, and then, yes, it's changed its name again, suggesting, I mean, on the one hand, it's tying up with the party in, at the European level, Renew Europe, Renaissance, but it's also suggesting this, why, why was that needed uh, is, uh, is a bit of a, of a question here. And the question here is then, in conclusion, that what happens with a, such a poorly institutionalized party, what happens in 2027 uh, when Macron can stand again? Thank you. Thank you so much. You ended with the question that I wanted to ask you, so I may come back to you to that in the Q&A because I would love to hear your, your answer to that particular question. So uh, thank you very, very much, Energy. Um, our third speaker today, moving us uh, a bit further along the, the political spectrum, is uh, William Rispin. He completed his PhD at the University of Warwick and is the author of The French Centre-Right and the Challenges of a Party System in Transition, published with Palgrave. And uh, he's going to be talking us, to us today about Les Républicains. Thank you very much, Rainbow. Uh, the, two, the, 2020, uh, the 2017 sorry, presidential and legislative elections were a disaster for Les Républicains. Its candidate, François Fillon, finished third in the first round, following a campaign that had been dominated by accusations that he had misappropriated public money. For the first time in the history of the Fifth Republic, there was no representative of the mainstream right in the second round. The fragmentation of the party was exacerbated by when several key figures were appointed to Macron's government, and Les Républicains was reduced to holding only 112 seats in the National Assembly. The situation has become even worse five years later. In 2017, despite the scandal that had dominated his campaign, Fillon had still managed to gain 20% of the vote in the first round and was only 1.3 points behind Le Pen. In the 2022 presidential elections, Valérie Pécresse finished not only behind Macron and Le Pen, but also behind Mélenchon and Zemmour, Mélenchon achieving almost five times as many votes as she did. In fact, her score of 4.78% of the vote made her ineligible to have her campaigning expenses reimbursed by the state. Whereas Les Républicains had managed to survive after its defeat in 2017, its disappearance from the political scene now appears extremely likely. This paper will examine the reasons for the defeat and disintegration of Les Républicains before considering what the future might hold for the mainstream right. It will argue that while Macron is currently in a strong position, his second, the end of his second term is likely to see a further realignment of forces on the right, which may allow the creation of a new party uniting elements of Les Républicains and Renaissance. 
And one major issue that has plagued Les Républicains for the past decade has been that it has been unable to find a charismatic figure capable of representing its political project. Indeed, the reason why Emmanuel Macron attracted the support of many on the right was because he appeared to be a strong leader. The roots of this problem could be traced back a long way. Sarkozy dominated the mainstream right from becoming president of the UMP in 2004 until his defeat in the presidential elections of 2012. He used his position as leader of the party first to become its undisputed candidate for the 2007 presidential elections and then once in power to ensure that no rival emerged to challenge him. However, such was Sarkozy's domination of the political scene that when he stood down, there was no obvious candidate to replace him. The inability of the party to unite behind a new leader during the Hollande presidency allowed divisions, which had previously been suppressed by giving priority to leadership over policy, to emerge. And these came to be represented by Sarkozy, Fillon and Juppé, all of whom had been involved in politics for several decades. The domination of the older generation prevented younger figures from emerging and developing a profile. And so when Les Républicains failed to win the 2017 presidential elections, they once again found themselves with no one to reunite the party and take it forward. The situation was exacerbated by the fact that several members of the younger generation who had started to establish themselves on the national political scene, such as Bruno Le Maire or Gérald Darmanin, were named as ministers in the Macron government. And this dearth of political leaders within the mainstream right was apparent throughout the Macron presidency. Although Laurent Vauquier became president of the party in 2017, he resigned following the European elections in which Les Républicains received only 9% of the vote. His replacement, Christian Jacob, was elected precisely because he made it clear that he did not have presidential ambitions, but saw his role as trying to resolve the problems faced by the party. No figure managed to impose himself or herself as the natural candidate for the 2022 presidential elections. Valérie Pécresse was chosen as presidential candidate in a vote which, unlike in 2016, was limited to party members. She was seen as a candidate who would be better able to win a broad section of support from the electorate. But given that her rivals were Ciotti, who favoured a hardline approach to identity, likely to alienate those outside the party, and Michel Barnier, who was considered something of a has-been before his role in the Brexit negotiations, the result was hardly a ringing endorsement. Although Pécresse briefly overtook Macron in opinion polls following her selection as candidate, she soon fell behind him and thereafter continued to lose support. A major problem was that she was considered to lack the charisma necessary to be president, a feature that was even acknowledged by one of her own speak spokespeople, Agnès Evren, who insisted that what counted was actions and not words. A further problem faced by Les Républicains in the latest presidential elections was the relative popularity of Emmanuel Macron. Whereas in 2012, at the end of his presidency, Sarkozy's approval rating had been 36%, and Hollande was so unpopular at the end of his presidency uh, that, oh, that he'd announced in December 2016 that he would not be standing for re-election. In April 2022, 41% of voters had a positive opinion of Macron. To make things worse for Les Républicains, 49% of its own electorate was satisfied with the outgoing president. And while Macron had often been considered by large sections of the electorate as arrogant and authoritarian, his personality was closer to that of Pécresse to voters' expectations of what a president should be. An ELAB poll found that 50% of voters felt that Macron had the qualities necessary to be president, whereas only 38% said the same of Pécresse. On the question of whether candidates were capable of reforming the country, 41% believed that the outgoing president had this ability, compared with 35% who considered that Pécresse did. Macron therefore found himself at a significant advantage compared to his rival from the mainstream right. And the build-up to the Russian invasion of Ukraine further enhanced Macron's presidential stature, as he sought to avoid war by negotiating face-to-face -face with Vladimir Putin. Although the talks were unsuccessful, Macron benefited from being seen as the embodiment not only of France, but also of the European Union. And this emphasis on his role as a leader was enhanced by Macron's decisions to delay announcing that he was standing for re-election until almost the last possible moment, and to focus much of his attention on the international situation rather than the presidential campaign. 
and this meant that debate over policy did not play a major role in the elections themselves. When the, president, the outgoing president did reveal his program, many of the key measures, such as raising the retirement age to 65, or proposing that recipients of the RSA state benefit should have to undertake work in exchange, were ones that had previously been suggested by politicians of the mainstream right. And the success, this success of Macron's strategy of winning over voters on the right was shown in the results of the first round of the presidential elections. An EFOP poll found that of those who'd chosen Fillon in 2017, 37% voted for Macron in 2022, compared to only 21% who chose Pécresse. And the results of the presidential elections would seem to show that Macron and his party, Renaissance, have become the main force of the mainstream right in French politics. Although the, French, the president has sought to appear to reach out to the left in the formation of his new government, it is likely that he will continue to implement many policies of the right. In the ministerial hierarchy, immediately behind the prime minister are the economy minister Bruno Le Maire and the minister of the interior, Gérald Damana, both of whom are former members of Le Républicain. The main opposition to the president will probably come from the left in the form of the NUPES alliance, including La France Insoumise, the Greens and the Parti Socialiste, which is predicted by some polls to win about 170 seats. In contrast, Les Républicains may be reduced to fewer than 40 deputies, with the result that the party will likely disappear as a major player in national politics. However, while the demise of Les Républicains seems probable, there is a high chance that, there will, that the realignment of forces on the right of the political spectrum will continue. Macron will not be able to serve a further term as president, and La République en Marche has always been his personal vehicle, as its original creation is En Marche, adopting his initials, emphasised. As yet, he has no obvious successor. Although his party has performed well in presidential, legislative and European elections, it has failed to implant plant itself at a local level. There's no guarantee, therefore, that, La, that uh, Renaissance will survive the president who created it. Now, Le Maire and Dalmana may hope to advance from their senior roles in the party to lead La Renaissance, to lead Renaissance and become president in 2027. Much will depend on the success or otherwise of the final Macron years, often complicated by the president losing his powers of control in the face of confrontation with former allies who now seek to replace him. However, it seems quite likely that another charismatic figure may well manage to create a new right-wing movement, combining elements of both Les Républicains and La République en marche. Macron's first prime minister, Edouard Philippe, is currently the most popular politician in France and has founded his own party, Horizon. His intention is clearly to present himself as the leader of political movements on the right and center once Macron has stepped down. He or some other charismatic figure might be able to construct a new coalition of politicians from the center and center right. The fragmentation of Les Républicains may therefore be likely only to mark a chapter in the broader realignment of the mainstream right in France that seems set to continue for many years to come. However, as I've argued elsewhere, one must not ignore the fact that the problems faced by Les Républicains form only one part of a deeper evolution of the political system. On the left, the Parti Socialiste's candidate for the 2017 presidential elections, Benoit Hamon, scored just over 6%, and in 2022, Anne Hidalgo received less than 2% of the vote. Voters' ident identification in the left-right divide that used to structure the party system has declined, and as analysts such as Brochet have argued, many now pick and choose policies from across the political spectrum. This was demonstrated in the original election of Macron as president, when as a former minister in a socialist government, he appointed leading figures from Les Républicains to important positions in his government, and can now be seen in his announcement that he will prioritize ecological issues. It may therefore be that the evolution of the Fifth Republic is such that, whereas one was once able to trace the mainstream right from the Gaullist party to Les Républicains, now politics must be analyzed according to a new schema, Macron's election as president had seemed to be an exceptional moment driven by a disunity within the mainstream right and a failed government of the mainstream left. However, his re-election suggests that more profound dynamics now prevail within the political system. Thank you so very much. Um, I'll move swiftly on to our final presentation of the day. Um, and one final shift uh, along the political spectrum. Um, so we 
uh, are now going to hear a, a, pre a presentation from, and I'm, I'm hoping I get your name right, but please correct me if I say it wrong, uh, Theo Aelfi. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm French, it's usually pronounced Theo. So, so Theo. But Theo works as well. In, I Thank you. So I wasn't sure if it was uh, from the surname, if it was French or Greek, so I'm just sticking my foot further in it. Absolutely, no worries. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so Theo Aelfi, who is an early career fellow at the Institute of Advanced Studies at the University of Warwick. Um, and his PhD looked at popular style uh, with a particular focus on Marine Le Pen and Donald Trump. And he will be talking about uh, the former and uh, the Rassemblement National uh, for us now. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for, for, for having me in this uh, very exciting workshop. I'm excited to, 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 to talk with fellow experts on, on French politics. Uh, I've, I've mostly discussed with, talked with Peter uh, Trump populism. So it's, inter it's interesting to see what you think of uh, of the analysis I, I, I bring in. And it was also very interesting to hear so many uh, connections with this notion of charisma that was discussed in the, in, the, in the presentations of my colleagues. So let me start. So I my background is in politics, but also in theater and performance. And so I like my presentations to be a bit different from what we've had before, a bit dynamic and visual. So I hope you you are ready for, the, for, for something slightly different and, you, and you'll bear with me. So uh, this the paper that I'm presenting is called Populism, Transgression and Mainstreaming, the State of the French for Right in the 2022 Presidential Election. And it is based on a series of three articles I've written for, for, for Jacobin on the state of the far right, which I'd like to turn into one article. And uh, uh, sorry, can you, see, can you see my screen just before I move on? Yes, we can see, you we can see your slides and your face. Notes. Wonderful. Perfect. Thank you so much. Amanda. Okay, so the starting point is uh, uh, obviously this whole discussion is is just looking at this at the at the far right score in uh, in the first round of the election. We get Marine Le Pen at twenty three percent and Eric Zemmour at seven point two percent. And the question is, how did the far right become so powerful in French politics when it used to be a marginal or even uh, fringe sort of uh, electoral uh, force? And so the discussion that I'm going to be to be following follows the the, the, kind of the structure of the three articles that I've written. The first one is on Marine Le Pen, and, it, and I'm going to talk about normalization and her use of populism, and I'm going to define what it is. The second part is more about Eric Zemmour and the, the, the challenge he raised, but also the complementarity of his line with that of Marine Le Pen. And I won't have much time for that, but, um, but I, I think I'll share my, my article on the mainstreaming of the right uh, uh, in the chat at some, at some other point. Uh, uh, but I will conclude on looking beyond just this duel between Marine Le Pen and Eric Zemmour to consider the mainstreaming of the far right more generally. So let's start with Marine Le Pen. I don't think she needs much introduction, but of course she's the heir of Jean-Marie Le Pen, her, her father, who's, who was head of the Front National up until 2011 when she took over. The, the word in the literature and elsewhere that, is, that has been most associated with her is clearly that of dédiabolisation, the dédémonisation, the idea of uh, normalizing, softening the image of a party. And she represents a sort of modernist line within the far right. Something else that needs to be added is that uh, reversing the stigma that female politicians usually face in politics when they're called by their first names or uh, infantilized, she used her own first name as a way to eclipse her last name, uh, the developing a sort of personalistic control by calling herself Marine and, uh, and, and building on that femininity to sort of uh, fulfill this the diabolization strategy that she's been pursuing for all these years. My doctoral research was focused in particular in 2017, which would, I argue was a major shift in the way Marine Le Pen was conducting her career. Uh, uh, her. So in 2017, suddenly uh, the campaign changed radically from the 2012 election, which was still very much a traditional forward campaign, in the sense that she openly attempted to appeal to the popular classes. She added social undertones to her economic program, um, even mobilizing left-wing concepts within her rhetoric, adopting ambiguity on societal issues like gay marriage, abortion, in order to avoid uh, to, uh, to avoid uh, any sort of controversial statement, and she presented herself as many others, uh, uh, which we just heard about Emmanuel Macron, who also did that by talking about going beyond left and right, and we also heard about. Uh, from Philippe about, about Mélenchon doing a similar, a similar move, but there was this idea that the, the, the left-right spectrum was obsolete and that you had to, to, to rethink differently. But the main change that I want to, to, to raise your attention to is that of the populist style, which is most evident in 
the way uh, in Au Nom du Peuple, which was uh, in the name of the people, which was the name of her, uh, her campaign slogan, but also in the Blue Rose, which is fascinating because it is a rose which is associated with um, a socialist party, but it is, a, it is blue, which is, which is the traditional color of, uh, of the right in France. And not any blue, it is Bleu Marine, navy blue, which is a, and yet another pun that, uh, that uh, emphasizes her personalistic way of doing politics. So yeah, I'm saying she uses populism. What I mean by populism, and I swear this is going to be the only theoretical part of, uh, of the argument, and I hope you'll bear with me. I don't mean populism in a uh, synonym with demagoguery or just with the far right. For me, populism is something very specific. And the approach I, I use in my work is inspired by what is called the discursive formative approach adapted from the work of Ernesto Laclau. And I understand more specifically populism as a political style that is built around the people elite antagonism. It is a way of articulating politics, which, which means that it is ideologically, ideologically agnostic or neutral. It doesn't have any specific content in its own, its form. And more specifically, I define populism following a definition from uh, performance studies. Diane Taylor talked about, uh, talks about repertoire. And I argue that populism is made of three core elements. And I'm going to come back to that later. First one is what, is, is what I just said, the framing politics as an opposition between the people and the elite through the embodied performance of an, of an individual. That's a classic Laclaian argument. And the question here is what kind of people, what kind of elite? The people on the far right and the people on the left are radically different. And also the, and similarly as the elite are. The second part, and this is what I've been developing in recent years, and I recently published on the topic, the uh, populism is about transgression. It's about breaking the rules. It's about looking different from the other politicians in order to appear more authentic. And the third part is uh, populism relies on the articulation of a crisis. The idea being that uh, a failure of a system, uh, unmet demand, to use a Laclarian term, only become, come to the fore through the mediation of a political actor that is creating the notion of crisis. And again, question of which crisis depends on whether you're far right, far left, and so on. So again, uh, I could talk about it for hours, but I, I, I'd be happy to take more questions about what I, what I mean. But 2017 was the archetypical populist campaign for Le Pen. She completely embraced this uh, people, this is elite uh, divide, and she fulfills perfectly all of the criteria that, uh, that I, I mean, I didn't make up, but, uh, but uh, emerged from the literature and populism. But what happened? is the debate. Uh, the debate was seen as a pivotal moment uh, where Le Pen would, would got completely crushed by Macron's very prepared, rehearsed, and uh, extremely well, um, let's say, even say professoral tone. To, and, and she appeared extremely aggressive over the top and kind of ruining and contradicting all of, all of her, all of her pre previous efforts at normalization. And so this led, and that's how I'm reaching 2022, to what, what has happened between, in, in between. After this failure, which, which saw Le Pen lose with 33% uh, of the vote, a, a landslide against Macron who got 66, is that she had to face two specific criticisms. The first one was personal about herself, an alleged lack of professionalism and lack of presidential stature that was especially hard given that it was uh, uttered by her own father in Le Figaro. But far from, he was from, far from the only one. The other criticism was more strategic. It was the idea that digitalization had its limits and the populist style was not the way to win. And this goes back to another line within, the front, within, within what was then called the National Front, the traditionalist line, most famously embodied now by Marion Maréchal uh, and Gilbert Collard, who, talk about, who argue that trying to become too normal may, means that you're going to risk losing any ideological backbone and thus any ideological specificity in front of the electorate. There were, there were even voices within the party that called Le Pen a leftist because she, she, she did advocate some, and, and again, it's very superficial, but some more left-wing measures in, in economic terms. And the argument of a traditionalist line that you should not aim to create what Jordan Bardella called the Front Populaire Populiste, a sort of appealing to the people beyond the spectrum, beyond the far right, but you should instead try to break the boundary with the, 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 weak, the weakening uh, les Républicains, it create what they call l'union des droits, or the union of the right wings. And this divide between the modernist and traditionalist line is not new. It's something that uh, has always existed in within the far right. You can trace it back even within the history of the Front National, between the, uh, the, the duel between Le Pen Père and Maigret in the 1990s, and most recently when during the struggle to take over the party when Jean-Marie Le Pen decided to step, uh, to step down between Le Pen Fille and Bruno Gonich representing the respective modernist and traditionalist line again. But what 
Lo Le Pen did is that she got rid of uh, uh, Florent Philippot, who was most clearly, clearly associated with populism as a strategy, again, inspired by Donald Trump and so on. But he decided to, but uh, he was also a rival that was taking increasing pre uh, mediatic presence. So she took him over, but instead of recentering or, or giving any, any sort of action uh, and move in the direction of the traditionalist line, she decided to double down on the diabolization. So she renamed the party from Front, which has this aggressive connotation to Rassemblement, the national rally. She softened her image. You have never seen her talk about cat breeding as much as you have in 2022, which was absolutely fascinating. And she removed even more controversial measures. She stopped talking about leaving the, Euro the European Union or about uh, stopping the going back to France. Furthermore, in the, not only did she, did she hybridize or, uh, or superficially steal from the, from the socialist themes, now she even added some green themes. You, you just have to look at this uh, campaign poster that looks straight out of a green party campaign you know, with, all of it, with sharp green and yellow. She even introduced the concept of localism, which was a sort of um, far-right adoption of, of some green themes. And she silenced internal opposition in a more ruthless manner, uh, re removing them from the Comité de, de, de Selection, the, um, of the, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm making a personal at this point, but removing some of these key members, uh, which led to Marion Maréchal, uh, who called who to, to even retire from politics. So because this internal challenge was silenced within the Front National, it was not a surprise that the external, that the challenge from this traditionalist line emerged elsewhere. And it emerged through the, the candidacy of Eric Zemmour, a very iconic and infamous journalist and pundit who is famous in France for being a polemist, a polemicist. So someone here to create controversy. He's a political novice in terms of electro electoral device, but he's been, but, uh, electoral platforms, but he's always been there in the public eye. And, he, and his rise was even more bolstered by the support of Vincent Bolloré's C News, who wanted to create the French Fox News. He was mostly famous for being a reactionary ideologue, an anti-feminist, an Islamophobe, a racist, and you could go on. But he embodied by, in many ways this return to the traditionalist line, calling for l'union des droits, challenging both Le Pen and the conservatives LR, uh, LR and appealing instead to, to the, a more bourgeois form of elite rather than looking at the popular class, which was what Le Pen was attempted to do. Economically speaking, in terms of ideological differences, he was much more liberal and strictly right wing, in, in contrast to the sort of hybrid things that Le Pen have been promoted since 2017. And of course, he was mostly famous for his controversies and his transgressions. He was an advocate of a théorie du remplacement, a conspiracy theory, and of course, of uh, historical revisionism by re uh, invigorating theories, uh, rehabilitating uh, Maréchal Pétain as the shield that protected the French Jews during the, the, the Second World War. And it seemed to be working in a way. And, uh, he even managed to get together the, soutien of Mar uh, the support of Marie Maréchal at, at some part of his campaign. But my question here is that, uh, uh, the point I want to make, and that's going back to my criterion populism, is that both of them were still called populists, but I argue that there were my clear differences also in stylistic terms, not only ideological. In stylistic terms, let me go back to these three people elite antagonism, transgression, transgressions, and performing crisis. Well, performing crisis was a shared, a shared theme for both of them, although the crisis uh, use was different. What was interesting is that Le Pen still re relied very heavily on this people elite antagonism, which, uh, which Zemmour did much more rarely, although he did do so in his first uh, big speech. But, um, and, and conversely, the transgressive performances became Zemmour's signature and became, uh, in consequence, much rare for Le Pen, who did not need to do as much heavy lifting to the transgression, because Zemmour was being the subversive uh, and making her feel look even more, even more normalized. And so, yeah, it seemed to be working at some point, uh, with Zemmour even contesting Le Pen's leadership role in the, in the right and challenging uh, LF's uh, um, power in, in polls. And this is one from the 4th of, uh, of March 2022. But what happened, and there's a combination of factors, but one of the pivotal moments was the, Russia's in, was the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, where both candidates had to come to terms with a pro-Putin stance. And, Compared to Le Pen's pragmatism, where, which, which led her to explicitly condemn Putin's actions, sweeping under the rug the support for her campaign that uh, Russian, Russian banks uh, uh, had done, Zemmour is famous for being an ideologue. So he is, he is unwavering in his conviction. And his ideological dogmaticism was also his, uh, his uh, fall from grace, because he persevered in his praise of Putin and still minimized the Russian aggression, which is not something that the French opinion was willing to listen at the time. 
it. So as a whole, the results are here. And the results are, as we said, uh, it's out of the three blocks that were just mentioned, the liberal bloc, liberal bourgeois uh, bloc, the NUPES, uh, popular left vote, and the third, uh, the, 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 the far right bloc was the, the strongest of them all in terms of electoral power. And what I argue is that what happened is that although they were rival, and it's interesting to look at the dynamics within the party, they were more, Le Pen and Zemmour were more complementary than anything else. In a way, Le Pen was further normalized by Zemmour's transgressions. And regardless of which line eventually triumphed, Le Pen, of course, Le Pen's, of course, far right themes still dominated the campaign at a time where many of the themes, including healthcare after, after COVID or the ecological crisis, could have been more salient. And yet, the, this uh, this dual uh, monopolized mediatic attention. So as such, it's not only an electoral victory, but also a cultural victory in the Gramscian term. But this wouldn't happen without considering the wider political field. And uh, this is my conclusion. I won't have time to dig, dig, dig in deep. And again, I would like to refer you to my article on this. But this was also possible, like this and the mediatic and cultural victory was, was possible because LR was itself very torn between Macron, who was completely who had shifted to the right and, and whose liberalism was challenging one of the core components of LR, which had to force to go back to his conservatism, and which led the presence of Eric Ciotti, a friend of Zemmour and someone who advocated many of, uh, uh, of, of his theories to have a strong influence in, uh, in Pécresse's campaign uh, as she mobilized the concept of red replacement herself. And, he, and looking even beyond that, uh, the entire uh, government Macron, especially since uh, Castex, uh, uh, Castex won, became a key or a sort of uh, a pathway to mainstreaming. And I, I just want to quote one moment, that is a moment in a debate between Interior Minister Gérald Darmanin, a former Sarkozyist himself, who accused uh, Marine Le Pen of being a little soft on Islam, which shows that, that, that Macron, although he presented himself as this last bulwark against the far right, enabled and contributed to, 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 to promoting the, the emergence of these themes on the public sphere. So my conclusion is that although Le Pen lost as well, her, she, had, she improved substantially from 33% to 41.5. In terms of legislative elections, as was discussed below uh, by, my, by my colleagues before, the legislative are not a sort of um, electoral output, that, uh, electoral uh, structure that is uh, favorable to, 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 to the far right. And as such, uh, Le Pen did not feel the need to create a union unlike what happened uh, uh, when, within the left and the center. So divisions prevail, even though Le Pen still holds that she dominates and she should not be contested. She, I think she, in a way she, she wants to, to punish the move for challenging her so profoundly. But the argument I want to make is that it's important to understand before it not as a monolithic whole, but as a complex uh, sort of inter internally divided set of, uh, of forces in motion. And it's just interesting to understand what happens within to understand what works and to kind of adapt counter strategies against it. Of course, we are at the state where Le Pen is the one dominating, uh, dominating the, the far right, but they are still complementarity with, with Zemmour who brings her, for instance, uh, the sort of electorate of bourgeois electorate from the South that uh, is not voting as much for Le Pen as she does, whereas she is more popular in the overseas territory, in the North towards the the precarious working class. And it, my argument here is what you, you can only look at what distinguishes them ideologically, you have to look at what distinguishes them stylistically. And finally, and I wish I had more time, but I'm going to stop it here, it is in fact it is important and imperious to look, to look at not only what happens between inside the forum, but look at the wider political field to understand why the forum has been so popular. And my argument here is that Les Républicains and Macron have been strong enablers of forum rhetoric. And I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So we've had four really terrific and interesting presentations. Um, uh, we've got half an hour left. So I think rather than inviting the panelists to speak back to each other, I'd like to go straight to Q&A if that's okay. But um, we may find that, we, you know, in the course of the discussion, our panelists speak back to each other. So um, if anyone, uh, either any of the sort of contributors today or anyone who's joined us um, as part of our audience uh, would like to ask a question. If you're able to signal through raising your hand, that's great. You can also place a question in the chat um, and I will call on you. 
I see we have a question from Malcolm. Yeah, sure. It was uh, a very specific uh, question, uh, particularly to uh, Philippe. Uh, I probably uh, missed it, but uh, I didn't see much discussion of the uh, the fact that uh, were it not for the uh, communist candidate uh, getting one percent uh, of the uh, of the vote, Mélenchon would have gone into the uh, the second uh, round. Uh, and I uh, I wondered if 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 I've missed it, if there had been any any debate about this, because of course the uh, the communists uh, haven't stood a candidate since uh, 2007. So uh, I'm wondering why they decided to do the, do so this time, with with uh, very significant uh, consequences, as it turned out. Shall I answer now? Yes, go ahead, Philippe. Uh, okay. Well, thanks, Malcolm, for your question. It's a fair question. You didn't miss anything. I didn't mention that. Um, there wasn't much discussion on on that, and I read a few things about it, and I think everyone seemed to agree, and myself included, that uh, it's not a foregone conclusion that had had there been a kind of uh, the Communist Party had it supported Mélenchon again, like it did the two previous presidential elections, uh, that would have been enough for him to to qualify for the second round. What I'm saying is that the one point something percent that um, Roussel got, uh, it's not clear whether those uh, voters would have uh, switched to Mélenchon in the first place, you know, if, if the Communist Party had supported Mélenchon. Um, because if you look at the, uh, it's a point I alluded to, I didn't have time to elaborate on it, but tactical voting was so massive, so absolutely incredible in the last week of the campaign, you know, even between the last uh, published opinion poll on the Friday, you know, two days before the vote and the actual results, uh, Mélenchon gained four to five points, which is quite amazing, absolutely staggering. And those votes were essentially coming from people who probably essentially uh, had decided to vote for another left-wing candidate there was also a little bit of support coming from uh, the young who normally abstain and who came out and voted for Mélenchon en masse. That's a fact. But also a lot of people tactically voting, not, be, not so much because they like Mélenchon as a, as a candidate or even they agree with all this policy, but it was just a desperate attempt to qualify someone from the left. So my point is that if you have a core of one point something percent who this, you know, decided to stick to Roussel, which was absolutely desperate candidacy, he stood absolutely zero chance to do anything. I think it's because to some extent, they absolutely didn't want to vote for Mélenchon. There are people on the left who absolutely didn't want to vote for Mélenchon for political and personal reasons. Mélenchon, in other words, is a very polarizing figure, as you know. So there are people profoundly dislike Mélenchon on the left. So I, I don't think you would have changed anything. No. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. I mean, just to say, I wasn't criticising you. It was just that I hadn't no, seen... No, no, no. Uh, and I, I said you didn't miss anything. the media about it. No, no, no. It was, uh, it's a, it's yeah. a fair question, I said, yeah. And, and if, if I may jump in, um, looking at, at, at the perspective of uh, uh, Roussel's campaign from the far right, his campaign attracted a specific uh, audience that was very receptive to these to, to the themes of, you know, like uh, there were endless jokes about meat and uh, French uh, uh, culture. And, and, and I think definitely these people would not have voted Mélenchon in the first place. So he attracted a very distinct uh, uh, kind of audience. So just to complement what Philippe was saying, I completely agree. I agree with that, Stu. Yes. Thank you. Um, I, I'm encouraging people to come in with questions. Um, as I'm not currently seeing any, I'm going to be cheeky and ask a couple of my own, if that's okay, because I, I have loads of questions after, after that session. So um, I have one question for Philippe, um, which is about um, Anne Hidalgo, uh, whether she hung on till the bitter end to try and protect the Parti Socialiste in the legislative and avoid them just becoming uh, non-existent, or do you think she would actually have been better off striking a deal <clears throat> Um, that included seats in the legislative before the first round of the presidential election? When, when do you think 
uh, was the the right time to negotiate? Do you think she played her hand as well as she could have done, or do you, or do you think she could have done that better? Um, and I'll give you a moment to answer. I'm just going to chuck in a couple of questions as well for uh, Elodie to think about if that's okay. Um, so my first question is is how different is Renaissance to the uh, UDF? Um, and the second is what future do they have? The, the question you alluded to at the end of your presentation, what future do they have beyond Macron? Uh, so thank you, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be quiet. So uh, over to you. Um, regarding Hidalgo, I, I suppose there was a kind of a calculation, political calculation, and also possibly a bit of a gamble on the part of, of Hidalgo and, and the socialist, um, the, the leadership. Uh, they were kind of boosted by the good results at the uh, municipal and regional elections. Socialist Party did well. And I think that's an important point, the discrepancy between the Socialist Party now, who seems to be with a good anchoring locally and in the region still, you know, with a network of elected officials. And it's very poor showing now at, at national level. And that's exactly what happened. And I think it was probably, you know, buoyed by those good results. She thought, otherwise I don't think she would have run had she known that she would not even fare 2%, which is a ridiculous uh, score. Uh, I think she, she thought that, that, you know, there was a sort of, um, uh, there was a sort of um, uh, space for her in between, you know, Mélenchon and Macron. And that maybe she wouldn't qualify for the second round, but at least get, 10, 15 percent and, you know, show that the Socialist Party was back uh, in business. It didn't happen because clearly uh, what happened five years ago is still going on in the sense uh, voters do not uh, want to support a party which has, you know, five years ago, uh, Hollande uh, completed his presidency uh, being extremely unpopular. His policies being rejected by its electorate, you know, sort of uh, on the left, and it still hasn't recovered from it. So it is one. It's it's a, it's, it's a paradox, you know, the party which can do well locally now, but with very t terrible results nationally. Uh, so that that's the reason, and I think probably yes, uh, had she known that, probably she should probably have supported the green candidate. I think that would have been the right move to go along. Uh, the uh, green candidate, uh, that doesn't mean that it would have changed uh, the results altogether. Mélenchon would still have benefited from tactical voting in the end, but I think that would have avoided at least this terrible result. And there are other reasons. I, th I think she didn't, she didn't lead a good campaign. She wasn't a good candidate. Uh, and she was, in my opinion, uh, too close to Macron's uh, policies in general, you know, there was, you know, it was very hard to distinguish between Macron and, and, and she on a number of things, not enough on the left, in my view. And I think that's what is interesting with Noobs. And I made that point in my presentation. It could give, it could offer a chance this, for the Socialist Party to sort of switch to the left, reconnect with a lot of voters on the left, people who are clearly on the left, uh, who are not ready to vote for Macron, and who still can't really so easily vote for uh, for LFI and, and, and Mélenchon. So at the moment, I don't know where they are. Probably they are the tender group behind Mélenchon by default. And I think that's uh, that's probably what um, what would have been uh, better. But I think, yes, that, that campaign was a disaster for Hidalgo. Thank you. Um, I want to give Elodie a chance to answer the questions that I asked, and then after that, we've got a very interesting question um, to all the panelists coming up. So, Elodie. Okay, thank you very much uh, for your questions, Mer uh, Rainbow. And so, yeah, the difference between Renaissance and the EDF. I'm not sure there is a huge amount of difference, to be quite honest, or, or, because it's that sort of general centrist party, more on the centre right than on the centre left. Uh, and presenting itself as a sort of modernist project as well, um, achieving some socially liberal reforms, obviously, under um, 
um, Giscard, uh, it was, for instance, uh, abortion, etc. Um, and so I think to a degree, the, the creation of the UMP has sort of helped create more space at the center by integrating some of those more centrist parties that were part of the UDF uh, at the time into that sort of big hegemonic project of the right and leaving a rump that was outside, which is the modem, which is now with uh, Macron. It helped create that space because there was a lot of disgruntled people on the center right in the UMP, and they had been promised a, a party that would um, allow factions and diversity in the party. There would be even a bit of money for those different groups to have their own thing. And then nothing happened. It became the project of quite hegemonic of the center right and then a very popular Sarkozy. And I think that um, created some of that space for a center right candidate, also helped by it. François Hollande and, um, and, and that collapse uh, at, the, at their own other end. But I think here there is some commonality with uh, the, the UDF. It's also that some of the people who were in the UDF thought maybe they would try, give it a go with the UMP, and then came back to Macron completely going over the modem, thinking it's not going to be a winning project in and of it, it itself. Uh, as for your question about the future beyond Macron, it's a really difficult one, uh, largely because if we cast ourselves back to twenty years, to ten years ago or five years ago, we wouldn't have imagined the emergence of a Macron then or a Zemmour uh, five years ago. So <laughs> there's a lot of time for the emergence emergence of uh, of, of someone, but to a degree the the. Uh, La République en Marche was built and its structure were developed to really limit processes of internal contestation, avoid having uh, other people become quite important in the party, uh, form factions, etc. Which means that it's really also not been great at developing people internally and letting people emerge as potential successes. Uh, whether Macron himself is going to try and steer that process of succession, or whether they will think, that's it, we're done. We've had our project. We got our man elected twice, and then let the market, the electoral market, do whatever it wants. Yeah. Uh, it remains to be seen, but um, th th there's a clear risk if nothing happens, in particular in the Les Républicains and the PS of a real vacuum of La République en Marche has kind of, I wouldn't say destroyed, but really weakened significantly the parties of the center right and the center left and presented itself as the only alternative against the uh, Rassemblement National. If there's no one that comes up either through La République en Marche or the other two, there's only um, one party left that has some strength. But who knows what could happen? There was a discussion earlier about how no one likes parties in France, and yet everyone has their own tiny party. It is completely ridiculous, and including, uh, as has been mentioned, um, Edouard Philippe with uh, Horizon. Uh, so th there's a multitude of, of, of mini parties that all of them hope somehow will be a vehicle for their personal ambitions. So who knows? <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have a question from Françoise who asks, we haven't heard so far about the party primaries for presidential selection last autumn and especially the so-called popular primary. Any thoughts from any of the panelists? Um, and uh, Theo has indicated his wish to respond to this. And I imagine that um, William and Philippe may also wish to throw their hats into the ring. Um, I might actually, if they will forgive me, I might give uh, William first shots at this. Um, so over to you. 
Thank you. Uh, well, the problem for Les Républicains was that they had a primary in 2016, and that was, at the very beginning, a great success. It got a lot of people involved in the party, raised a, a large amount of money. But then it led to the election of Fillon. And ever since then, the idea of having a primary was always something of a dirty word for Les Républicains, because they didn't want to go through another process where they, were end they ended up with some sort of tarnished candidate. And so they had did everything possible to avoid having to hold a primary and were hoping at some point that someone would magically appear between during the uh, Macron Kakina, who would just automatically be uh, above and beyond everyone else, the ideal candidate. And so it was only very late in the day that they actually decided to have a primary, precisely because there was no candidate who stood out from anyone else uh, enough to impose themselves. And uh, so, and in fact, when they did have one, it wasn't even a primary in inverted commas as such. Uh, in 2016, the previous primary had been open to anyone willing to sign a charter saying that you had, that you supported the values of the right in the center and pay two euros each round. Whereas this time it was reserved to those people who were members of Les Républicains. So uh, that Les Républicains are still tarnished very much, oh, I'm very wary of primaries due to their previous uh, experience in 2016. And I think that's you know, something that's likely to last. Thank you. And um, was your hand raised to answer this question or, or did you have it raised for an Yes, no, sorry, it was to answer the question. Great, thank you. Um, okay, uh, I'll invite uh, Theo in and, and then Philippe. Thank you very much. I, I, I'd also use my time to, so to ask a question to William right after, but I think the, uh, as, as, as he just said, the, the primaries have become a bit of a dirty word since the, since the failure of the respective candidates in 2017. And it was fascinating to see that the only parties who did them were the Greens and the Republicans, and it initially gave them some electoral momentum, some kind of power. But I think the reason for the lack of, for the lack of success in the long run is that it, it did not solve um, contradictions within parties that were too torn. So the Greens were torn between a sort of social liberal, pro-Macron uh, wing, uh, although Jacques Jadot really tried to distance himself from that, and Rousseau, Mélenchon compatible uh, dynamic. And I think this tension was not solved given that the, the result at the end was so close, 49, uh, 51. And it was exactly, it was not exactly the same for, for, uh, on, for LR, but, but LR had this tension between the liberal and the conservative wing, with CUT being, being at the head of the first round. And the CUT uh, appeal did not, did not disappear, and it, it became even stronger, I would argue, as, as, as Zemmour arrived. And that's a question I want to ask Will, actually. Uh, what do you make of this appeal from Zemmour, which is, suppose it, uh, which is by, by most accounts, more to the far right than Le Pen, but it's somehow more palatable to this uh, to, to the Les Républicains and to some of their electors uh, than Le Pen, who has been uh, this pariah. And, uh, and just a small word on this uh, Primaire Populaire. Uh, I think it was seen uh, in Christian Toubira's uh, short-lived uh, uh, aspiration to become president was seen on the left as one yet another factor of, of division, where the divisions were too big within the left for one candidate to unite them all. I've seen criticism that Tobira was more form than substance, which talks a lot to, to my work, because she represents as a as a uh, a very charismatic black woman, uh, uh, something very different. But her party, but her ideological substance was was very uh, blurry and uh, and. And anyway, uh, I think these primaries have shown that there's a, a, a will for union, but uh, it needs to be done under a sort of programmatic uh, basis. And I think that's what was lacking in previous primaries. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I will give uh, William a, a chance to respond in a moment to that question, but I'm just going to uh, go to Philippe first to talk about the uh, Prima Populaire, if that's okay. Right. I think I'd like to, to first make a point about the, uh, the, the journey, so to speak, of the, the primary elections in, the, in French politics. Uh, if you remember back in, 20, uh, in 2007, I think the Socialist Party organized the first primary open to non-members. It was Ségolène Royal uh, who won it, and at the time, it was uh, the idea was because political parties are in crisis in France; they have fewer and fewer members. Uh, in in order to legitimate to legitimatize a candidacy, one needed to open up and to have the grassroots level supporters uh, have a say. 
And it's interesting that now 15 years down the line, the part of the French parties are ever more in crisis, even more in crisis than 15 years ago. But now it seems that the primary election, the principle of the primary election is, is also in crisis because look, it didn't work. And uh, if it seemed to work for a while for the Republica and the Greens, it didn't really uh, boost their, their electoral fortune. So there's something, I think one of the reasons is that it works if, there's, if there is party discipline. And the 2017 example in social, Socialist Party where uh, once uh, Benoit Mont for the Socialist was elected, you saw that his opponent uh, literally as the sniper decided to launch a terrible campaign instead of rallying and supporting him and, and switch to the enemy, uh, to Macron. And I think that was really, in my view, the end of, of, of an idea of a primary. If you don't have that kind of loyalty and, and, and support, it, it doesn't work. And uh, still, there was one, just a brief word and comment about the so-called uh, popular or citizens uh, primary. First, it, it came too to, to late. It came too late. It was organized by people who, who didn't have any party allegiance. It could have been really a, a, a plus, something interesting, but it didn't work because it came too late. It came with a list of candidates which were kind of... Um, the organizers co-opted candidates who are already candidates for their own movement, uh, Mélenchon, uh, Jadot, and, and, uh, and also Hidalgo. And Mélenchon and Jadot clearly refused to, to take part in that. So it was bizarre. They were, they were candidates in that primary election and it didn't want to have anything to do with it. They did not uh, recognize the result. So that was bizarre. And Tobira was elected, but yes, I agree with Theo. It was seen as yet adding more division at a point where the left was so already fragmented and weak that people couldn't put up with that. And to be fair, I agree that Tobira is a wonderful politician, uh, but probably the momentum's gone for her. And she came to that election, frankly, uh, she was not prepared for it. You know, she was the anti-Mélenchon. Mélenchon had been preparing for it for years and he was really ready for it. That's why he was successful, at least on the left. But she was not prepared and she, it also showed. So for all these reasons, but that, that's bizarre because primary elections could have been an answer in French politics to the ongoing crisis of, uh, of, of political parties in France, which is the state of parties in France is far worse than here in the, in the UK, far worse. Still, it doesn't do it because it seems that now they, no one will want to organize a primary election. Thank you very much. Um, Elodie, I see your hand. Uh, was this in an immediate response to what Philippe was just saying? Okay, uh, I'll take Elodie and then uh, William, I'll come back to you to answer Theo's question. Go ahead, Elodie. Thank you, yeah. Uh, I might want to actually argue that the primaries are also an element of, that weakens political parties, because what's the incentive to become a party member, for instance, if the biggest decision that your party can take is actually in the hands of everyone else? Why would you become a member of the Socialist Party if you're not going to be involved in choosing who's going to be um, a candidate for the Socialist Party, for instance? or the same for, for all the other parties. You can also see that as something that does weaken the uh, incentive for people to join and feel an attachment to, to a political party. I mean, I've got plenty of to say about the, the, the popular primary as well, but I might move on to, <laughs> you might want to move on about that. Um, uh, yes, if I may very briefly, I'm, I heard that argument, which I think is a weighty argument in, back in 2007 when for the first time uh, non-socialist members could vote. And I think lots of people in the Socialist Party was, were unhappy about it. But I think at the same time, people understood in the party that uh, it was a way really to, to sort of engage uh, the wider electorate. So probably also with, the, with a bit of political buzz, the media attention. So I think overall, I remember that uh, past, you know, the first moments of, you know, why are they going to vote? Because I'm a, I'm a member, I pay, I pay the party levy for, and, and I should have a say, they shouldn't have a say. But in the end, uh, that, that idea of a primary election uh, became more, more, more popular. So um, 
I think in the end, the no, I just will, will leave it there. I had another point, but I lost my train of thought. It, it never mind. And if I could just briefly again on this as well, I, I, I do agree that with Elodie that uh, primaries may weaken parties, but not for the reason that they are, they are open to more people, but more because they're, they're encouraging personalistic uh, allegiance rather than uh, internal lines within the party. You don't vote for uh, some some line within your party, you vote for a person. So in a way, it, tri it trivializes the, the role of a party as an articulating um, core of, of politics but uh I, I think it's, yeah i think it's a very shallow engagement with the parties uh that it creates and does not really i mean uh, yes. i remember my point uh, look, let, let's look at the the candidates who came first second and third in the first round who voted for them to become candidates who party members no no one they were self-appointed candidates Macron, Le Pen, Mélenchon, no one voted for them. So that's, that's you see, that's an argument where mm. it's uh, this idea that because you're party members, you, you're going to get a chance to choose your, your candidate. It doesn't work anymore. But, but Mélenchon still claimed a sort of popular legitimacy. He had a number of signatures and votes saying that uh, people have asked for me. He didn't come out of nowhere. And like Le Pen, who relies on dynastic uh, uh, control of the power of the party and and Macron because of his presidency, presidential role. That's right. I'm could I'm going, could sorry, I have I'm organized to, a primary to, election in the party? I'm going to intervene because we're almost out of time. William's waiting very patiently for his turn. And we also have a question from Sue. So uh, over to William and, and then to Sue, please. All right. Uh, the first thing I'd like to uh, add is to on this issue of primaries. I think that it's not just that the primary weakens the party, but the very reason that they had these primaries was because the parties themselves were already in a very weak position. They couldn't come, as Philippe, you pointed out, uh, the parties that did well all had an established candidate. The other parties hadn't got an established candidate. They were struggling to look for an electorate who would vote for them and to know exactly what that electorate was going to be. And so the primary seemed to be the only way out, the sort of the olive branch that was thrown to them but that you know, wasn't that wasn't any help in this case and it but precisely because they were so weak and then uh to go back to your question Teo I think one of the uh issues on uh why if it if, on why Zamor appealed to Les Républicains well there are several issues one if the uh, Rassemblement National has been going through a period of trying to of dédiabolisation at the same time there's been elements on the right ever since 2012 who have wanted a, dro a droite décomplexé and to a certain extent uh, Zamor spoke to those people uh, there might also be the question that uh, they'd lost some faith in Le Pen because of her performance, as you said, in the uh, 20, in the debate in uh, 2017. And so Zamor seemed someone uh, more towards what they were going for. As you also pointed out, she was had leftist elements to her programme, or at least economic programme, which would have put people off. And also he's someone who I think who's seen as more of the right. He used, he had a column in the Figaro, that like he's definitely someone who's positioned on the right in a way that Le Pen has tried to avoid, uh, wants to be ni droite ni gauche, but uh, Zamor is, has always been someone who's very much on the right. Thank you. Uh, Sue? Yeah, it's just a very brief comment about the primaries, but um, it's a, you know, we're rubbishing primaries now, but if you think back to when Francois Fillon won the primary with, I think it was 4 million votes. Um, I mean, if it hadn't been for Penelope Gate, um, history would have been rewritten in a completely different kind of way. I mean, nobody thought at that stage that the party would completely implode. I would, I would venture to state, I, th I think, I think Fion's candidacy was problematic even before Penelope Gate broke, but uh, uh, not in the catastrophic way that it turned out to be. Sorry, Elodie. No, no, uh, Dory, I was just going to say, yes, it's, it did indeed engage a lot of people for some of the reason that William was talking about engaging people beyond because people weren't quite engaged with the parties themselves. And in that sense, they were very successful. But 
<laughs> their success has not actually led to strengthening the parties themselves. But not because of the primary. Not necessarily, but they haven't helped. Uh, on the other hand, the primary election, uh, socialist primary election of 2012, uh, boosted pretty much uh, Orland's campaign, you know, and, and his election. So you, you can't be said that, you know, primary elections have been a failure throughout. Uh, I think they've served a purpose for a while. And I think the probably the puzzle, the puzzling thing is that why suddenly has it stopped? Maybe one of the turning points is the 2017 one, which I already mentioned, when, you know, once uh, elected, you know, Socialist Party instead, particularly the leadership, instead of supporting the, the elected candidate, they, you know, started to, to, to undermine his campaign. And, and given that the Socialist Party had been, you know, the, the one which initiated in France this, uh, this idea of a primary election, which did not exist before, I think probably uh, having really uh, undermined themselves the very principle of a primary election, the socialist, uh, then probably, uh, yeah, it, it's uh, uh, probably, I think that the, the sort of a fairly, fairly successful primary election this time around was a green one. But again, the result was very, was neck and neck and very, you know, between two, two versions of, uh, of green, uh, um, of green, uh, green policies, you know, two different candidates. And so in the end, you could tell that instead of having a party united rallying around one candidate, there was lots of tension, internal tension. So again, that didn't help very much to have this primary. Thank you. I'm aware that we've gone past four o'clock. Um, so I would suggest that we wrap up our session on political parties, even though it's, a fascinating topic and I'm confident that we could keep going for another two hours if we allowed ourselves to but I'm going to force us to stop in the interest of time. Um, we have half an hour left or just under half an hour left of our workshop today and the idea was that we would use those concluding minutes to look forward to the legislative elections which is something that we haven't directly broached thus far. Um, I don't know if people would like to go straight into this or whether people would appreciate a two minute comfort break. Um, Can I just say that I'm going because I'm, I was supposed to teach at four, at five past four, so in two minutes, but I really enjoyed this, this session. Thank you so much. I really wanted to keep going for a whole hour. So thank you. And thank you. Enjoy the rest of the thank you. Um, I might suggest that we keep going. And if anyone wishes to take a quick comfort break, they are welcome to, uh, just walk away from their computer for a couple of minutes and, and rejoin us. Um, I Because we've ended that panel, we're now uh, reopening to uh, the full 11 panelists that remain from the session. Um, I did ask whether it was possible for us to turn on the microphones of our attendees for this final session, but I don't know whether that's possible. I've not received a reply to that. So uh, I hope we'll be able to, to bring you in in some form. But I, at this point, I'd just like to invite any of the panellists who feel that they have uh, something interesting to say about the legislative uh, to raise their hand. Anyone have a hot take on they think who's going to who's going to win? William. Uh, sorry, I think it's like very likely to be Macron and probably Macron quite comfortably, if only because of the institutions that uh, because ever since uh, 2002, the presidential elections have been followed a month later by the legislative elections. We are yet to see uh, a situation where the electorate goes out in one election and elects a president and then immediately goes out in the next election to elect uh, a presidential majority of a different, uh, sorry, a parliamentary majority of a different colour and to impose cohabitation. And I don't think that uh, that's likely to change this time. I think that there will be plenty of people who will go out and vote uh, and give Macron a majority and yes I think the left will do much better this time but I think there will be plenty of people on the, uh, but I think that may come at the expense more of Les Républicains perhaps than of all uh, than of the Renaissance if people on the right say oh, the left has got its act together 
uh, but the right wing vote is divided. I don't want to see a member of NUPES as my representative, so I will go and vote for uh, Renaissance, even though I'd normally vote for Les Républicains, just to keep the left out of power. And you'd have a similar sort of tactical voting as you saw on the left in the uh, first round of the presidential elections, where people rallied behind Mélenchon, despite there not being an official pact. Thank you. Um, I'm about to bring in Malcolm, but I just have some exciting news for the attendees today that we have managed to give you microphone access. So if any of you would like to join in the discussion, we would absolutely love to hear from you. So uh, please do avail yourselves of that, um, either to talk about the legislative or to ch chime in on any of the other topics we've discussed today. Malcolm. OK, I'll be brief on the uh, legislative uh, elections. Uh, and uh, as a historian, I, I shouldn't uh, be uh, predicting, but I'm, I'm inclined to think that uh, the uh, Macron East will uh, will come out on uh, on top. Uh, one of my reasons for uh, for thinking that is that uh, I think turnout will inevitably be uh, be poor. You know, the the, the system adopted since uh, 2000 uh, has uh, inevitably devalued the legislative elections, which which were the main elections. Uh, before uh, you know, going back uh, further in history, and now they've been, uh, you know, devalued by placing them after directly after the uh, the, the presidentials, and I think uh, the sort of people who uh, who support uh, the, uh, the the far left and the uh, the far right are more likely to uh, to abstain in these elections, whereas the uh, the older, solid, established middle class people are, are going to turn out. And I, I, I'm inclined to think that will uh, give uh, victory to uh, the uh, ensemble. Thank you. Um, would anyone else like to come in? Uh, I agree with what's been said about uh, uh, a Macron victory or its party victory is likely. Uh, with also, I agree that the left should increase its number of seats. Um, it would have been very safe five years ago to say, well, Macron will get an overall majority. Uh, I think he will still get one, but uh, I think this time around things have changed a little bit. This is where the bit of a nuance, I would like to nuance a little bit what's been said. In a sense that if you look at the rerun of 2017 in the second round, Macron won again, but with a um, diminished um, um, majority. You know, he certainly wasn't, um, two candidates were closer. And he won again uh, with the support of left-wing voters who voted for, for him, not because they it wasn't a, a show uh, with, in, with the intention of supporting him because they wanted to stop uh, the election of uh, uh, of Le Pen. So I think what, what I'm getting at is that the electorate is probably more volatile than it was five years ago. So it's more unpredictable as well. So in terms of mobilization, yes, I agree with you, Malcolm. Normally it should be the sort of the young uh, working class abstaining more. So uh, that would sort of, uh, that would be at the expense of Le Pen and Mélenchon. Uh, but it's also Macron is probably less popular, or let's put it this way, uh, uh, probably people are more determined on the far right and on the left to sort of defeat him now than five years ago. So that for all these reasons, they, although I would still place my money on, on the Macron uh, Renaissance victory, but there could be some a few surprises in some constituencies here and there, so which would in the end alter a little bit the sort of uh, the overall result and landscape. You know, it, it could be it could be Renaissance ahead, but without a majority in the house. Thank you, and I have a follow up question to that, but I'm going to put it on pause because uh, Daniel Gordon in the audience would like to ask a question. Daniel, please go ahead. Hi, yeah, thank, thank, thanks everyone um, for some really interesting papers. Sorry, I haven't been able to, to, to hear, hear it all and I've had the training today as well. But um, 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 I mean, well, firstly, I think I have a sort of partial answer to, to, to Malcolm's question about why did the communist stand a candidate? Because um, I, I did do some observation of, of Roussel's 
um, campaign. And I think the most fundamental issue is that if you don't stand a candidate in the first ballot of a presidential election, then to that, to that segment of the electorate that only, that only take an interest in politics um, of presidential elections as if you don't exist. So you know, if you go 20 years without, without standing a candidate, it's, you know, it's, it's as if, um, you know, it's, it's as if the, 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 the uh, communists are, are, are dead. But, but, but my question actually is, is about um, a particular constituencies. So, so I'd, I'd be really interested to hear from, from those of you that have been following the, the parliamentary campaign more, more closely than I have, which particular constituencies do you think are going to be the most interesting ones in terms of, um, of, of kind of, you know, two or three or four way battles to, to watch out for? Thank you, Daniel. Um, would any of the panellists like a, a first pop at this? We don't even really know who's standing where exactly yet, do we? I mean, that's still kind of pretty much on uh, the I think I think yesterday or today was the last day to present your candidacy, but I, I, I... I don't know. I don't know well enough at the constituency level where it is, and also sometimes it's a bit murkier because some um, incumbents are not standing again. I mean, La République en Marche. I was just looking a bit briefly earlier. It said in some places they've removed. They've just decided to change who uh, will be the candidate this time around, so they'll have a dissident, formerly, um, uh, formerly uh, La République en Marche. Uh, candidate against the ensemble candidate, so it's very confusing. I know that abroad is going to be interesting because Joachim Sancorge, who's the uh, who was elected for La République en Marche and then had a break there, I don't know what's wrong with this guy, uh, is now uh, in Switzerland. That's the way his constituency is. Uh, he's now for a uh, candidate for Reconquête. For uh, uh, Zimmer's party. <laughs> yep. Really? Wow. Yeah. Um, well, I, I should say what made the second round of the uh, 1997 and 2017 uh, elections unpredictable was that there was in the second round three, if not four candidates running. So. Uh, triangular, quadrangular, as the French say. And of course, when you get to that situation when you have three and four candidates in second round instead of the usual two, you know, one, broadly speaking, from on the left, one on the right or far right, it, it is much more difficult to predict who's going to win the seat in the second round because you've got four people and they all run for, the, for themselves. I think this time around it shouldn't happen. There should be very, very few, a handful of triangular and probably zero quadrangular. The reason being that the um, uh, the political uh, landscape in France has dramatically changed uh, over the past five years. You know now you've got three big blocks instead of having you know left and right and, and two or three strong parties on the left and right. Three blocks: the Macron bloc, uh, the far right bloc, and the left bloc. Noops. And for this reason, in the first round, you know, they will go with, with one tag, you know, representing, you know, one candidate for the left. Uh, there will be very few dissidents. There will be some, but not many. So if the left goes united, one candidate per constituency, uh, I think in many, uh, in many circumstances, you know, the left will qualify for the second round. Not all, but many. And also there is the rule, let's not forget, in order to qualify for the second round, any candidate in the first round needs to get to receive 12.5% of the share of registered voters. That's the way it works. So again, that's a threshold, you know, which eliminates uh, a lot of candidates in the first round. So for all these reasons, I think the, the big thing is to wait for the first round and see how things, you know, uh, shape up and and then it'll be probably easier to uh, to, uh, to to predict uh, who, who's going to win the seats in all the constituencies. I think that the southwest could be quite interesting from a point of view of the left, 
because uh, Carol Delga, who is uh, head of the Occitanie region and from the Socialist Party, has come out with her opposition to this uh, new alliance, this new PES alliance. And uh, so it'd be interesting to see how voters react to that. I, I would assume that they're likely to go towards the new alliance, but uh, depending on how well you know, they, they identify with her as a person and her views, there could be some uh, chances of some dissidents there who might succeed. I'd like to also add to support Philippe's point, which is that having a low level of turnout makes it even harder to achieve those 12 and a half percent of registered voters and makes the number of triangular uh, probably even low. I, I don't know how important this might be, but it seems to me that in France, a lot of people um, with the pandemic like here have moved out of the towns and cities into the countryside. I've certainly seen that um, in Normandy where I am. Um, and that might just change um, the voting patterns of some of these areas. If you've got an influx of kind of more urbanites into some of those more rural areas, might it make a difference? Um, I, I'm not sure of the scale of it, but I've certainly seen sort of from the the grassroots level, um, massive impact of um, people moving out of the cities into rural areas. So will that make a difference? I don't know. I have a question to throw out to my fellow panelists. Um, with, I, I would concur with the expectation that uh, Macron is going to get a majority, but the size of that majority is obviously in question and whether it's an absolute majority is also in question. So uh, the, the scenario I'm going to put to you is what if, what if Macron ends up with a slightly hung parliament where he has a, more seats than anyone else, but not an absolute majority? Who would prop up his government, if anybody? And um, would this be seen as an opportunity for the Les Républicains to, to get into government or would they be utterly resistant to teaming up with Macron because they'd see that as sort of the final nail in their coffin. If I may uh, pick up on that, which is what I mentioned this morning about the horizon, that faction being potentially the pivotal voter, the pivotal player in, in the National Assembly, especially if there is a high parliament, then you have uh, that, um, that danger. Um, uh, that's quite interesting because if you have veto power uh, and you have a cohesive uh, group, um, you know, that could really disrupt governing and um, who knows, even a motion of censure against the government, it's not impossible. But somehow, like Philippe, I think that, uh, there is going to be a majority uh, for the Macron's coalition, even though it may be reduced. Uh, I have a feeling, but and, and as uh, Elodie and um, um, Philippe said, uh, that threshold of entry for the second round is very high. So 12.5% of registered voters. So that often means, you know, close to 20%. Plus, as Elodie uh, stressed, the low turnout. So I'm trying to find out how many triangular races they were in 2017, but I can't find it uh, on the uh, on the spot right now. Maybe somebody else can. Um, but I don't think there were many at all. Um, anyway, that's what I wanted to say. Mm. Malcolm, then, what, sorry. So Malcolm has raised his hand, and then we'll come back to you, Philippe. Uh, you're, you're still Sorry, I wasn't uh, raising my hand, I'm afraid. It was an involuntary movement. I my think. apologies, then, Philip, please right, come in. Right. It's all right. It's all right. Uh, just uh, for the record, that's what uh, uh, gave the left a victory, uh, an expected victory, by the way, in 1997, the number of triangulaires across France, and that uh, you had a conservative candidate, Front National, and the left. And that's how the left won you know, dozens of seats this way in, in, in those triangulaires. That, that's, that was really the, the way for the left to win it. And I think given as we all agree that there will be very few, probably a handful of triangulaires 
uh, that is probably will make it more difficult for the left again for that for that reason because uh, also the left uh, this time round tends to be very strong in certain areas urban areas uh, big cities and whereas the Macron vote is more you know spread across uh, you know the territory you know so which which also is is an advantage uh, so. Um, I think that uh, the point that I, I started, I, again, I, I, I lost what I, so I just passed for the time being, but I, I wanted to say something else again. <laughs> I it's been a long day. We feel the Yes, same sorry. <laughs> I, I had another thing to say, but it, like earlier, probably till come back later. So the, the floor is yours. Anyone else want to come in or any other questions from our audience? Maybe we have reached an actual conclusion. It, as Francoise rightly says, it has been a long day. We've had so many interesting discussions um, and much food for thought. Um, so I might take this opportunity to, to give a, a few thank yous, um, not necessarily in order of importance, but I'd like to start by, um, by certainly a very important thank you. I'd like to give a huge thank you uh, to Tamida Karnan, uh, our unsung hero of the day, um, who has done all the background work for um, setting up the Zoom link, um, setting up the registration page, making sure that everybody received um, invitations and access and that everything ran smoothly on the day. Um, so she's my colleague from uh, Queen Mary Politics and IR and I'd just like to say a huge thank you to her for making all of the logistics happen. Um, I'd also like to thank um, the PSA French Policy and Politics Group for contributing to today's event. Um, I'd like to say an enormous thank you to all of our panellists today for their fascinating contributions. Uh, thank you all so much for, for being part of today's event. Um, and last but not least, thank you very much to our audience for coming along and uh, sticking with us through a, a long day and um, listening patiently and uh, asking a couple of questions along the way. So uh, thank you, everybody. It's been, it's been terrific. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. <laughs> Bravo. Thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.